We're living in the hashtag me too generation where men don't quite know what to do with their fullness. They yeah. don't know what to do with that, of the full depth and breadth and wildness of them. And, and they're afraid that if they bring that to the feminine, they'll destroy her or get accused of being too much or taking advantage of her or overpowering her. Yeah. And so here we were women choosing to say, guys, give us everything that you have. And it was fucking holy. Yes. What was, what like, was divine masculine? Like, yeah, go all the way back. Give us a like, little, like uh, all the way up okay. to when we met. It's <laughs> <laughs> a little hot in here. You know? Hopefully my nipples are not hot. I'm Layla Martin. I'm your host of This Tantric Life. This podcast is for you to learn about and be able to use the incredibly powerful system of Tantra in your life. I have been teaching and studying classical and neo-Tantra for over 20 years. And when you apply that to sex, love, and relationships, as I love to do, you end up having conscious relationships, the deepest, most epic and magical sex, and the kind of intimacy that you get to be grateful for on your deathbed. And I want you to have your own magical journey in your own way that takes you from wherever you are now to the most outrageous and true and beautiful expression of sex, love, and relationships that is available to you. Hi, and welcome to This Tantric Life. My guest today is Mama Gina. She is the author of Pussy, A Reclamation. She created the School of Womanly Arts where she basically teaches women how to fucking woman so hard, so deep, so beautifully with the power and magic of their pussies. But to me, she is a sacred sister, one of my absolute best friends, the woman that I call every single day because she's not only the innovator of tools and practices, things like swamping and bragging and doing a courtesan's journey that are so transformative that literally tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of women and people of all genders can cite her as the source of one of the most powerful transformations they've ever had in their life into their pleasure their power, their Eros activation. But she also lives these tools every single day. The way that she holds me and us in sisterhood, the way she's been a fierce stand for falling in love with the divine masculine, for being able to open herself in deeper and deeper ways from the power of her devotion, it inspires me every single damn day. So it is my highest honor to have her here and for us to have this conversation around how together in our journey of sisterhood, we have become true devotees of the divine masculine. Damn. <laughs> so good. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Amazing. You're amazing. You're amazing. You're amazing. Spellcasting <laughs> by Layla Martin. <laughs> You're like, what are we going to wear on the podcast? Lingerie question mark. And I was like, yeah. Yeah. And then you flew all the way from New York City. I did. And I was like, I have an eye infection. And we're like, <laughs> we're just so fucking fabulous. We're going to like own this so hard. Well, you know what? When you're a woman, it doesn't fucking matter. Like whether you have uh, an eye infection, What it, it doesn't matter how you look actually. It's how you connect to your erotic power your aliveness that is so magical and so i love that you're willing to be game the fuck on even with obstacles because mm -hmm. that's what womaning is mm -hmm. you know we always have to be game the fuck on because there's always obstacles <laughs> always i remember that that was one of the things very early on that you shared in our friendship was you were like Every single day you have to fight for your beauty and your yeah. radiance and your turn yeah. on and your magic yeah. because the world's not going to do it for you. In yeah. fact, if anything, the world's going to kind of take it down for you. Yeah. So like every day you get up and you do it. I, I look at it like we all have to be like gorilla pleasure warrior women <laughs> or we're not going to get it. Like if we keep waiting for like the pleasure fairy to arrive and bonk us on the head and shower us like Cinderella or whatever those people were with joy, juice, aliveness, sex, uh, just delicious experiences of who we are as a woman is never, ever going to happen. Like that shit has to be carved by us. Like 
literally each and every day. And it does not get easier over time. It's not like once you know about pleasure, you have a free pass. <laughs> it's not even once you have practices, you have a free pass. It's like the same thing as going to a gym. If you don't show up and do the work, you get flabby and weak. And oh, I don't have time for that shit. <laughs> we pump in pleasure I, iron I over here. Time. You yeah. do not have time for that shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, there are millions of things I can talk to you about. And yeah. in the topic of, of this episode, we're going to dive into your journey with the divine masculine uh, and, and mine as well, because yeah. it's been very shared. We have been very shared. <laughs> yeah. So we have been shared. How, and- long, how long has this sharing been going? Is it like two years? Is it two solid years of sharing? I think it predates that. It predates that? Yeah. Okay, so like. Because it definitely predates mm. my sort of like rupture of falling in love. Like we were already deeply yeah. connected before that. Yeah, that's that. true. I think that's three true. years. We were, we were, because we were in relationships that we were not able to really find our magic or our liveness. Like we were pretty certain that, we were not living the fullness of who we were born to be as women, but we were also a little hesitant to let go of where we were because, you know, everybody else thought, oh, you're doing so damn good, queen. You have no complaints. But meantime, it was not the fullness of who we are. Yeah. And so we had to bust out. But the thing is, like, we're so lucky we got to bust out together. Oh. (laughs) I just, I just want to say, like, sisterhood is the real, real, real. It's the real. It is how women get to not just make their dreams come true, but live an aspect of themselves that would be impossible to live were it not for sistering. Mm-hmm. And it is where the power lives. Like, that is, that's like mine, you know, kind of my, uh, I don't want to say calling, mm-hmm. is to teach women to sister enough to liberate this planet in the ways it requires liberation mm-hmm. because in sisterhood everything's possible so why i love visiting you so much oh my god literally i would fly if you call no matter when you call me i'm like on the next plane hmm. Hmm. so let's will you start for me and start for everyone with just a sharing of your journey with the masculine Right, because we're going to talk about how you've gone all the way to this Mm. like life changing, Mm. expansive. We'll give you like a little like you know like like sneak peek of just like like we're going to talk about like your pussy and heart being like so like fucked open, so Mm -hmm. ecstatic Mm -hmm. in this relationship you're in right now. Yeah, but start us at the beginning. What was what was divine masculine like? Yeah, go all the way back. Give us a little like uh, all the way up to when we met. All right. It's a little hot in here. You know? Hopefully my nipples are not popping Thank out. God. No, please bring okay. the nipple. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I think like so many women, you know, we have a, 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 a lot in common, but I think that we both had abuse patterns in our family that were um, unbelievably hurtful and painful and, and in a way designed us to be the women that we are today because we came, we became like heat seeking missiles to liberate women, especially women who came from abuse patterns that were deep or generational or, or, you know, cause I, I mean, I don't think you can encounter a woman who hits age 15, who hasn't hit some kind of verbal abuse, uh, uh you know, uh, violence, um, sexual abuse, uh, just there's so many ways which a woman can be flattened by the masculine. Mm. And for both of us, we had these patterns inside of our own families. Mm. And so I think that from that time, it was kind of like my destiny to try to figure out what the fuck, like how could I connect and have that sense of ecstatic love, partnership, surrender, when I was fucking terrified, Mm -hmm. literally scared to death Mm -hmm. of men Mm -hmm. because the experiences I had had been so violent and, um, you know, I I hadn't ever felt trust. I never Mm -hmm. felt held. I never felt love. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have it inside my body, but it didn't mean I didn't want it. And I feel like so many women have that same longing Mm -hmm. without having the patterning inside of them 
but the longing doesn't go away. And, mm -hmm. and, and I feel it's almost like this place in uh, the evolution of our culture where that union between man and woman is not just personally evolutionary, mm -hmm. but required by our world for its unfolding. Mm -hmm. And for its healing, mm. you know, because and at the same time, it's like, you know, the uh, amount of single households is increasing, the amount of divorce, the amount of people who are not risking partnership is increasing. So it's 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 terrifying, not just for me and and for you at a certain time in our lives as at very until very recently, but it's it's kind of global. Yeah. So uh, I I just started out just really scared and fearful of boys and men. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I had my first, like, truly big love affair when I was in college with my first big boyfriend who I was together with for seven years. And he loved me so much yeah. that I had to run away from that. Mm -hmm. Like, I couldn't handle it. I could not handle it. And I'm so lucky I saw him about six months ago and got to, I remember <laughs> that. Oh. <laughs> you know, got to just like replace, uh, you know, all the ways that I, I'm sure I heard him and uh, with love. And yeah. so it was really beautiful. Um, and I'm grateful that I got to have that experience with him. But then, I, and then I, I, I was with um, women for a long time. And that was super healing and wonderful for me. I, I feel like, you can find and connect to your body with a woman in a way that perhaps isn't always available with a, a male partner. So that was a beautiful part of my journey. I had uh, probably the next uh, significant relationship I had was, well, I moved into a sex commune, which is where I got my studies. As that, you do. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you go from you being do. like a repressed <laughs> celibate hermit for almost a decade, literally, just like doing research on the ancient goddess culture mm -hmm. and indigenous cultures and just being like all in my head and then realizing like there was no liberation from there. So I was like, okay, got to switch gears and I'll move into a sex commune. And I, <laughs> it makes sense, right? <laughs> um, and I, I had the great good fortune uh, of being with Lafayette Morehouse. It was then called Moore University and uh, I had just had like the most profound experiences, education, freedom around my orgasm, my sex, my sensuality. Like it's, it's that place made me the woman I am today. I'm mm -hmm. eternally grateful. And with, there I got married, but I got married to uh, basically uh, the guy who was father to my daughter, but it wasn't a really a love match. It wasn't like a deep soulful connection. It was just kind of like what we did. We experimented in those environments and the experiment was marriage. Mm -hmm. um, so I did that, then divorced him, raised my girl myself, uh, had lovers. Oh my God. What got me through raising my kid was incredible lovers. Oh, I was so grateful for them because like I could not handle running a business, raising a kid and having a partner, especially with my abuse pattern. So I was just like, let's just go for this sex because the sex is so enlivening. It keeps me connected to who I am mm. as a woman. Like I am an orgasm junkie. Like I love getting off orgasm sensuality. It fuels me and fills me. And I was so blessed yeah. with uh, lovers. And then somewhere in there, I did fall in love with this extraordinary man. Ooh, wow. I thought he was going to be like, he was the everything of mm. the everything of the everything, you know? Mm. And, um, and then within our, uh, relationship, he, um, he got, uh, a skin cancer that moved to his spine and brain and he died. So I lost him. And then, uh, I just stuck with lovers after that for until Maggie was grown. And then when she was grown, I met this extraordinary man named Peter mm. And uh, he and I, uh, uh, like, we met in the space of orgasm, mm. which was probably, it was a gift from the great pussy in the sky because, you know, I was still very shut down 
you know, as mm-hmm. a woman. And you didn't really know how shut down I was because mm-hmm. I thought, you know, like I'm here and I'm available and I'm hot and who wouldn't want to be with me. But meanwhile, <laughs> not much was shaking because there must have been something in the way I was interacting with men that was not allowing that to unfold. But Peter and I met in the space of orgasm because I had a practice called extended massive orgasm. He came from a school where they, uh, they called it orgasmic meditation. And so we, it was the day that Hillary Clinton lost the election. Mm. I was about to deliver a workshop to 2000 women plus maybe 2,500 at the Javits Center in New York City. Mm. I was going to wear a white pantsuit and run around the stage with a big American flag because I was certain Hillary was going to win. And when she lost, I was so devastated, I could not get up from the floor. Mm. I was sobbing. My whole staff was sobbing because we saw everything that was coming. Mm. As women do, we intuit those things we can see. And... Uh, so I called my uh, partner who I do uh, the, this practice with, and I was like, can you please come over? I need an orgasm if I'm going to go hit these women because I'm sure there's uh, Republicans and Democrats in my audience, and I want to be able to love both, and right now I don't love both. And so he said, I- I'd love to come, but I have meetings all day. I'm so sorry I can't. I was like, motherfucker, you get me a pair of hands. And you make some dude show up at my house who knows how to stroke pussy. I don't care who it is have somebody come. And he was like, fine, I'll take care of you. And the person that knocked on my door that night while I was sitting around having a big team meeting with my mother, my daughter, and my whole staff at my dining room table was Peter. Mm. Mm. And, and one of the defining things I think about that you struggled with with Peter, um, was he didn't match your idea of what partnership or love was supposed to look like. You know how fucking crazy we are as women. We have such, you know, I knew I needed him to be incredibly successful. I was incredibly successful, so why shouldn't I have that? Uh, I Not bald. <laughs> uh, you know, you had to be like dashing. Like I was mama fucking Gina for fuck's sake, you know, and I need like, like a really splashy type of guy or whatever. And he just was not that. But here's the thing that he had. He had had this magic superpower of love. Mm. And that was a superpower that I needed so hard. Mm. You know, I I was going through rough spots with my kid and with my school. Mm. And uh, he was just there, like, loving the fuck out of me. And it was every, every nutrient Mm. that I required. Mm. And, and so even though he w- didn't look like the guy uh, and he didn't really act like the guy, mm. but that superpower of love was fucking amazing. Mm-hmm. And I was guzzling that by the, like the boatload, the carton, the crate. It was so, he, he helped me to heal so much in my family lineage mm. with my kid who was struggling with an eating disorder mm. at the time. Mm. Uh, and, and and I can say that because she's given me permission to say that. And Mm. I think it's useful because I think so many women struggle with that and you can heal from that. One Mm. of the main ingredients is collaborating around that with a family and with support Mm. and with love and Peter provide the grounding for me to do that. But, uh, at the same time, we could never get our sex life off the ground. Mm -hmm. And, uh, there was no room in our partnership for my whore. And uh, I, I remember praying about it and just saying, you know, great pussy in the sky. Like, I am so devotional. I will never leave this man. But if there's something better for both of us out there, please bring it or show me the way I'm so open. Mm-hmm. And then I met a dude that I fell head over heels in love with, as you recall. And, uh, and and let's like I, I just really want to back up with the Peter experience because I think it's important to pause there and really understand like Peter was showing up with so oh much love and oh so much care and so much attentiveness and he proposed to you. Yeah. You were actually engaged. Yes, yeah, I still am. Yep, you're still. <laughs> but I moved the ring to this finger and well, we've reengaged to the truth. Right. Okay. So, but I I still wear his ring. And I remember, so 
you know, at that time I had by then come into your life, right? Yes, like actually we actually met each other because you wanted coaching for you and Peter. Yeah, I remember. So there was like these early kind of sessions. Yes, we tried. And working we tried. We were trying to, you know, put some polarity in. Um, totally. But his profile is he's a pleaser, mm. meaning that he wasn't really grounded in who he is or what he wanted or his stand as a man. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't find a way to connect to that part of himself. He actually didn't even think it was important. He didn't hold it as a value because pleasers, all they want to do is please. Yeah. They just want to make us happy. And th that is so, uh, it's just like kryptonite to polarity. Yeah. You can't like, I just wanted him to show up and take what he wanted and stand for what he wanted, but he could not even find that part of him because it had never existed. Right. So we were, we were fucking stuck as fuck. And it feels like you kind of spun through, you know, so many of the archetypes that women have, like I'll try like whatever version of marriage, like white picket fence, like let's do this. Yeah. Like, even if it's not a white picket fence, I'm still going to go for it. Yep. And then in, you know, just sex. It's hot. It's heavy. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's raw. It's fulfilling. That's part of it. Right. Me. And honestly, a lot of women don't even give themselves permission to have that. Right. And like you gave yourself that as yeah. a single mother, you gave yourself that as a creator. Uh -huh. And then along comes Peter and you get the love that you've always yeah. craved and wanted. But independent of Peter, there was a split in you that you had right. never had sex no. and love together so it was like sex was still over here and you still had mm -hmm. a lover who fulfilled you deeply I did. sexually with peter's full permission he was like great go do that totally you have that and go then you ahead. had love right and you had a I man had who could love you yeah but wasn't knocking your socks off sexually yeah. if anything like the sex was almost like it was a struggle a it's lot of the time total struggle yeah Exactly. Every now and then. Yeah. And I remember at the time you asking me and Annie if we thought Peter was your person. I remember. I remember. And we said yes. And it was like you'd received a death sentence. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's it's so important just to really pause on that. Yeah. Because sometimes our minds, our expectations, our programming, our trauma, our childhood can cause us as women to miss the divine masculine when he's right in front of us. Exactly. Totally yeah. miss it. And actually, our, because, you know, here's the thing. If we've never felt it, it can almost seem repulsive. Repulsive, foreign, uncomfortable. Uh, like wrong. Yeah. That there's just something wrong there. Yeah. So I could not let in the man that he was. Mm. And, uh, you know, because he's, he, he and I just... I, I had, I just didn't, I, 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 you know, it's like that song. I want to know what love is. <laughs> I want you to show me, <laughs> you know, and I couldn't, I, he was showing me, but I couldn't let it in. Totally. So you made this prayer to the goddess. You were like, show me, show me, help show me. me, help me, help me. I'm fucking stuck. And this man who was the spitting image oh my God. of everything that you'd ever wanted, right? Uh, Six foot something. Yeah. Like, you know, world changing career, yep. standing for the good of the planet. Mm -hmm. Like you two could be power coupled together. Exactly. And he had, you know, in so there was that spark of like, this could be true love. Yeah. And the raw sexual attraction. Yeah. And the finesse. Yeah. So tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess the more was that uh, <laughs> both of us were in relationships at the time. Yeah. And I don't fuck with other people's men. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I, I flirt with everybody, men, women, children, dogs, but I don't, I don't fuck around. I don't, I don't betray a sister. So uh, we had a really deep friendship. Maybe you'd call it an emotional affair. Mm -hmm. uh, at, during a time in his life when he really needed a lot of support because he was going through uh, a tremendous amount of, how should we say, activism on mm -hmm. behalf of the planet that mm -hmm. was very stressful and it's my jam. You know, like, oh my God, like I, what a dream to be with somebody that is as devotional in their living and as devotional to Earth, our mother and the great pussy in the sky and the great cock in the sky and the whole thing. So, uh, but I uh, had a strong boundary about having any kind of sexual relationship with him he ended up leaving his wife. Mm -hmm. I ended up leaving Peter. 
and uh, we had, you know, a year of whatever, you know, it, it, of the process of uncoupling. For me, it was a conscious uncoupling. For him, it was whatever he was doing. But that thing fizzled before it even got off the ground. You know, it was almost like as soon as he was free, it was. Right. And, but during that time, it was that burning love. Oh, my God. It was yearning. a hunk, like hunk, I hunk anything, of burning love. Like, oh, oh like, it's so much fun. Obsessing about whether a text would come yes. in or not. And oh like the drama and the cycles, oh right? There was, so, there was so much longing. Yeah. And I think it's important to note because, you know, one of the things I've really been reflecting on we have more people in our society, which is, I believe, a spiritually starved society that mm -hmm. can show you how to get to God or be enlightened yeah. than we do who can show you to get to true love. Mm -hmm. We have more people showing you how to meditate mm -hmm. than how to worship the woman or man or yeah. person in your life. Yeah, absolutely. And so there's this whole huge gaping hole right. in our knowledge mm -hmm. of what true love looks and feels like, mm -hmm. of what partnership looks right. and feels like. And for us... You know, it's like we have all these codes of what partnership could be like for women who are so much more repressed, bounded, yeah, restricted right. by the limitations of right. all kinds of oppressive regimes, yeah. be it misogyny, racism, patriarchy, mm -hmm. any mm -hmm. of that, homophobia. And so we're also living now this reality of we have the privilege where it's much safer, at least where we live, and that is certainly not globally true to be our high priestess, mm -hmm. witchy, badass selves, mm -hmm. to make money on our own terms, right? Mm -hmm. There's no fat cat mm -hmm. CEO at like CNN mm -hmm. who's deciding whether what we want to wear is appropriate or not right. for our podcast. Right. We can do whatever we want, yeah. right? And so in that, I think as a society, we're starting to discover what can partnership actually be? Mm -hmm. What's even possible? What can partnership be? with women who've remembered the power of their pussy mm -hmm. and that they are goddesses. And then what can partnership be like with the man who remembers he's God? And mm -hmm. this is a whole evolutionary exploration. Mm -hmm. And I think we can humbly say like, like how little there is that we know. Yeah. And sometimes true love can feel ordinary or your mind can even be resistant to it, or it cannot fit what you thought you were looking for. So you can miss it. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think it's e even one level deeper. I feel like our programming is such that the actions, the way we communicate, the things that are sort of like patterned into us, let's say from our mothers, our grandmothers, our great grandmothers, are completely useless mm. in building and generating intimacy, mm. in uh, creating ever expanding pleasure. Uh, you know, they're actually pleasure destroyers, Yeah. you know, uh, uh, or, or even this Layla. Uh, and, and I want to say that I also think as soon as we finish this little bit, I think it'd be useful for you to do your history until now, before we go to the next level, because we got to track together really closely, but mm -hmm. we'll get there in one sec. So he, what I was doing, you know, because, Hey, I was the first in my family's generation to go to college, mm. you know? So that was huge. And I was definitely the first person to ever run her own business, you know, or create uh, uh, the pleasure revolution or movement or write uh, four books or all the things, right? So I am used to, you know, over time, because I, I didn't know that I had any of this in me. And I hope that's inspiring to anyone out there who's, wondering if they have some kind of life path that's bigger than them. Yeah, you do and do it. Um, but what I was able to do with my career was I was able to get shit done. I was able to be powerful. Mm -hmm. I was able to be like, no, uh, you know, let's make this happen. All of those tools and, and what I want matters. All of those tools are useless in partnership. Mm -hmm. They're fucking useless. And that's what I was doing with most of my time. The other part of my time, I was repeating the patterns that my mother had taught me, which is disapprove of a man, mm. be quietly resentful of him, no matter what he does. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, just, it, just it, I, I came from a legacy of uh, an unhappy woman uh, contributing nothing but her disapproval to her partnership. 
And uh, I was repeating that even though with every cell of my being, I did not want to be. Mm. But so between being a badass bots bitch, a warrior woman mm. who was like blazing through the culture and, you know, breaking open the patriarchy and leading a mass movement. And then, you know, my disapproval, uh, it was like a recipe for fucking disaster mm. in partnership. Mm. You know, I, uh, Peter didn't even have any breathing space, no matter what he did, he was going to get some colossal form of shit from me. Mm. And I think it's something that so many women deal with because many of us make more money than our dudes. Mm. And that's a bit of a flip just even in one generation, mostly it was the other way around. So yeah, bad, bad, bad manners. Yeah, and it's it's such a common thing, right? Like women being like, I disapprove of him, you know, I'm sniping at him, I'm sitting here fuming, and like, why isn't the sex great, you know? Exactly. It's like, and who wants to fuck someone who kind of hates you, you know? Yeah, exactly. And you get so much agreement from the girlfriends. Yeah. They were like, oh, you could do better than that, Regina. I mean, come on. Come on, like, you're Layla Martin. You could do better than that. Mm. You're Layla fucking Martin. Mm. Come on. Mm. You know, so it's, it's a clusterfuck. So, all right, let's get you up to here <laughs> where I am and like get all the tawdry. Let's get the tawdry tale from birth till now. <laughs> so, all right. So, number one, you know, my biological father, uh, abusive, uh, sociopathic, pathological liar, uh, sexually abusive, and to me, and, and then left. And, uh, didn't, didn't want me. So that was very, my mom wanted joint custody and, you know, he doesn't want you. So there was just already so much programming. And, you know, one story that's really stuck with me, even in spite of all of the abuse is my aunt telling me, you know, like, I remember you being a baby in a high chair and knocking a banana off and your dad screaming at you until you froze. And so just mm. like a level of feeling so unsafe with the masculine, so unprotected, um, being so pervasive in my nervous system and in ways that, you know, I can't always even comprehend, right? right? Because that right. stuff just goes in so deep and yeah. gets so coded mm -hmm. in your nervous system. Yep. And uh, my mom, bless her, chose much better the next time around. Uh, so my stepdad Amazing. came into her life mm -hmm. and- I remember as part of, you know, part of the yeah. journey, just to kind of note, my stepdad showed up eight years younger, hot as shit, graduated MIT, Stanford, you know, like he was just so brilliant. So everything. My mom's got this like little kid. She's like getting a divorce. My stepdad's like, you're the one, like, I want <sighs> you. My mom was like, get the fuck out of here, man. <laughs> like, wow. like I'm getting a divorce. I got a baby. I don't got time for this. Yeah. And he just was relentless. And she surrendered. And I actually asked my mom, I was like, how did you make that quantum leap mm -hmm. from this abusive psycho, right? I won't go into the trauma he wrought on yeah. her because that's her story to tell. But for sure, given what happened to me, it was gnarly. And I was like, how did you switch to my stepdad, who is a right. really incredible, upstanding man? Yeah. And she said, you know, if, if, I, if I chose not to love again and I didn't let myself have a good man, then your dad would win. And I didn't want him to win. Ooh, wow. Yeah. So she chose my stepdad. Now, something that was additionally hard in my programming with the masculine is my stepdad, and I didn't know this until a few years before he passed uh, away from cancer in 2017, um, but he, he had a very abusive stepfather. And so one of the ways that he showed me love was to actually stay very distant from me because he was afraid of ever... Uh, passing on the abuse to me. Mm -hmm. He was afraid of what, what might be inside of him because yeah. of his programming. And so that was an act of love. But what it felt like to me was there's this man who takes care of my mom and they went on to have children and he's very distant from me. Yeah, He doesn't treat me fully mm -hmm. like his own child. He did and, and he didn't. So I had a yeah. kind of double programming yeah. of distance and abandonment mm -hmm. and abuse. And... When I uh, first... Are both of your dads passed away? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So that kind of, you know, when I, when I first 
started, you know, had my first boyfriends, I would go into such strong trauma responses that I couldn't even speak. I'd be shaking. And right. Didn't know what the nervous right. system trauma right. was back then. Like right, it wasn't right, part right. of the cultural conversation. Right. So like my first boyfriend who was so amazing shows me his penis and I literally froze and couldn't speak for 30 minutes. Right. Like that's how deep. I had that experience too. The fear and trauma was. Yeah. And, and or the emotion being so insanely powerful. It was like, I, it would take me right out. Totally. It, it, it's, it's crazy totally. how that works. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. So you had, and then what did you do with that? Like when was the first time that you created some kind of reckoning or work on yourself or like, how did you, how did you deal once you started to notice, like I'm a motherfucking head case at the moment. <laughs> well, one of the things that I did that was so painful that I didn't really realize until years and years later was because I was having so much pain trying to connect. Yeah. So much pain with boyfriends, so much pain with yeah. sex. It was just horrible. Yeah. Uh, I just decided that the reason they would break up with me or leave me was because I wasn't beautiful enough. And so I engaged mm. in deep spirals of self-hatred, yeah. hating my body, hating my face. It's not just you, baby. That is all women. Totally. And I didn't realize that that was a protective mechanism. Like my Ooh. self-hatred, judgment of my beauty yes. was a way to keep men yes. away. Because yes. if I yes. felt so unworthy of their attention, mm -hmm. they would never get close enough right. to be able to hurt me again. Right, 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 right. It was genius. It was genius. You know, it's amazing how we find these adaptations. Like for me, I became like a hermit. So I didn't have to even venture into the world of partnership because mm -hmm. I was just like, I cannot, I cannot deal with this. It's too overwhelming. It's mm -hmm. too, it, it, it'll just take me out. And then finally, you know, I set foot, but I tried everything. I tried therapy. Mm -hmm. I tried uh, all kinds of transformational courses. And it wasn't really until I found pleasure, sensuality, uh, that my healing began. Mm. Was it the same for you? Or did you have, like, how did your healing journey begin? Mm. I mean, mine was really through spirituality. So um, I went to Asia uh, when I was, I went when I was 15, but then I went back when I was 18. And I started meditating and doing yogic practices mm -hmm. and kundalini practices. And there's no way to sit in a 10 day meditation retreat and not start to experience what's in there yeah, and the intensity of that. yeah. Uh, and then it wasn't until I had my first like adult boyfriend and he was like obsessively in love with me. And he was such a great match for me. He was brilliant. He was hilarious. He loved like wearing like chicken onesies and like lobster outfits and like making it's me perfect laugh. Perfect for you. He was so, and he went to all the Tantra workshops with oh me. Oh my God. He like marched in butt naked to a Tantra workshop and was like, Tantra is <laughs> about freedom. And the girl was like, get out. And he was like, you're not a real Tantric if you can't handle nudity. And I was like, bro, you right. And like, <laughs> he was great. He was a, Ivy League graduate, like tech hottie, who like then became wow. a stripper. It was like, it was, wow. it was so good. Oh and he loved God. me so much that he was like, Layla, all I want is your healing. So we like lived in New York City for a period of time and he would go and strip and bring home money and pay for my therapy. It was like his devotion oh. went so deep. And you know what I felt with him? Nothing. Wow. Nothing. Three years of yeah. nothing. Mm -hmm. And it was right around that time because he wanted to look me in the eyes when he made love to me. And like he treated me so well and he worshiped me that I started like either just completely freezing, like I could feel nothing right. with him, right. or I started throwing up over the side of the bed and being like in so much disgust that I could barely even function. So I was like, wow, yo, I should probably go, should probably, probably see someone about this. I should probably go to therapy. <laughs> and so I started therapy and I was doing even more neo-tantric practices at that time. We were going to tantra school, all mm -hmm. of that. So it all kind of came together yeah. at the same time. And I would just watch myself descend into these totally uncontrollable rages, feelings. It was so overwhelming. And then when I started really healing a lot of that trauma, like the whole world went gray for a while. You know, it was so, it was so hard to just like get through. And then finally I just, you know, well, I forced us into an open relationship. Then I broke up with him. It was all very messy. I just couldn't, I didn't know how to sustain yeah, love. I it. didn't know how to receive devotion. I get it. I didn't I know it. how to it. be in that level of sex without yeah. it feeling so wretched and wrong and right. horrible in my body. And I didn't know what to do. And I tried so hard for so many years. Yeah. So eventually I just left. Yeah. I get it. I get it. I get it. Wow.
it is that is you know it it's actually when you get when you start experiencing the thing that you most long for you get the most triggered yeah and it's uh, and we don't have any tools or technology for how do you move through that part or and so I'm so glad we're doing this yeah because I feel like you know it's almost like you know, uh, when when I teach women about pleasure one of the most important things for a woman to register is that she will never want to have a pleasurable experience. Mm. She will always resist pleasure. Mm. It's just part of it. We don't resist pain, mm. you know, but we do resist pleasure. So mm. once you can realize that and you can be like, oh, wow, you know, I'm spot, I've just, I've just created this hot night with myself or with a partner. Uh, and I'm, I, and I'm suddenly I have a sore throat. Do, no, is my ankle sprained? No, I think I need to go to a, uh, uh, I, I need to get a blood test. You know, you you start resisting, yeah, and so then you you can get you yeah, like oh wow, this is probably going to be a really fun night, you know. <laughs> but we don't have that around relationships. Like no oh. one has broken that out. That actually, when it starts to feel really intense, really frightening, really traumatizing, really like shit, really like you have to fucking bolt. Mm -hmm. That is the time that you know you are closer to what you long for than you have ever been in your entire life. Totally. And people will be like, well, what about like horrible, toxic, abusive relationships? You're like, you know, those feel good in a weird yeah. way. Yeah. You know, the reason you right. stay is because right. you're like, eh, it's such a drama, feels bad, but feels real good yeah, at the same time, exactly. you know, and it's totally different Yeah. than this. Like, well, it's like the, the way you feel bad when you're getting what you really want is like the way you feel on a detox. Uh huh. <laughs> like you know, you're doing the thing that's good for you, and you feel like shit. Right. You know, you've had like your twelve green juices in. Right. You're, like taking all the charcoal in the world, and you're like, I just want to die right yeah, now. Yeah, exactly. You know, and exactly. like the pleasure's on the other side. Right. It's a but, few days later, but you got to make it through. If you right. start eating fried chicken, you're done. Right. And the course is charted. Like yeah. there's people there saying to you, "This is just the hard part. This is sticky wicket. Hang in there, baby." Yeah. And inside of relationships, we don't really have a lot of tracks laid down for when you get to those parts and you really need like sistering, you need support, you need someone to uh, say, no, don't, don't quit now. Like hang in there. You're onto it. You know? Yeah. And because even couples who do really love each other, who are well matched, mm -hmm. don't understand that. Right. Don't have the technology. They'll just go numb. They, they go numb or blame each other. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, so anyway, I'm delighted that we're talking about this because anything that we can do to make this path a little bit wider for others yeah. uh, would be so valuable. All yeah. right. All right. So wait a minute. So we're, are, am, uh, uh, so I, that was uh, first boyfriend. I leave. I find like like sexy town boyfriend that ends up in devastating, horrific misery. Um, and then And then I meet Andrew. And Andrew was a beautiful step up in that, you know, we, we changed the world together. We built life-changing things. We yeah. had a really deep, beautiful tantric practice together. We healed together and we fought a lot. And one of the things I can say is I knew nothing of how to see the divine masculine in him. I knew nothing yeah. of how to truly hold a man with reverence. Mm -hmm. And so I can see how early on in our relationship, I created such a deep lack of emotional right. safety, mm -hmm. of psychological safety, of spiritual safety right. that I never saw the best in Andrew mm -hmm. because I didn't know about the divine masculine. Mm -hmm. And not to mention, you didn't know the best in you. Yeah. You know, and until we have that piece in place, it's really hard to see it in another. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. So, all right. So let's take it from there. And I truly didn't know any better. And that's mm -hmm. what's so humbling. I'd done so much work, so much meditation, oh so much tantra. Oh I, done this, I did the school of women in the oh arts. God. You know, I did, did all the all. things. And in the meantime, we're doing practices every single fucking day. We're bragging. We're doing gratitudes. We're doing desires. We're doing swamping. We're doing spring cleaning. Like, we are being thorough. We are cleaning our clock to the best of our fucking ability yeah. to show up yeah. inside of all that's taking place and all yeah. that's happening. And it still didn't lead us to that ultimate thing that we both knew we, it was ours to live yeah. in this life. Absolutely. And so we were there with each other, like, like we became very close. Yeah. 
when you were a year or two in with Peter, I think maybe a few more. And I was probably five or six years in with Andrew. Yeah. Uh-huh. And we were there for each other during right. the like, should I stay or should I go? Oh my God. My whole heart's not oh being open. God. My whole pussy's oh not being God. open. But I have Dude. this amazing man who loves me, yeah. who takes really great care of me. I have a better relationship than most relationships I've ever, ever heard, ever heard ever, of, ever seen. Ever. So how dare I? How dare you? Have the audacity dare you? to even potentially consider leaving this amazing thing. Yeah. Plus, if I just keep working, you know, I, I knew then uh, it, it did turn at a certain point with me. I blamed Andrew for the first couple of years. Andrew wasn't spiritual enough. Andrew wasn't yeah. the king enough. Andrew didn't do X, Y, and Z right. enough. Exactly Andrew what I was wasn't doing intimate with Peter. enough. All yeah. of that. All of it. So Andrew wasn't thriving. And it wasn't until I was like, yo, Layla, like, if you haven't had what you've wanted your whole life out of a man, the problem is you. Something significant happened in your life. Yeah. While you were trying to sort all this out. Yeah. Yep. So I'm just bumbling along trying to figure all this out and, and really being like, no matter what, I have to open my heart. I have to end the alienation. Like I have to get right with the masculine. Like I know that. And here's the thing. None of my partners that I had were like the one in the sense that I should have been with them forever and missed out. But my degree of fulfillment, my degree mm -hmm. of pleasure, my degree of orgasmic ecstasy, my degree of being king and queen would have been so much deeper yeah. had I known how to worship the divine masculine yeah. then. And so what eventually uh, transpired was I was doing all this work on myself. You know, me and Andrew were working so hard, doing so much. And, and thank God, because I really transformed myself. And I fell so hard in love, like, like just like, boom, you know, overwhelming experience. I was just like, what the fuck? Like, I didn't even know you could feel this way. It's like, I took MDMA, ayahuasca, LSD, and it's just never ending. I stopped sleeping. I stopped eating. It was like, whoa, right? And now, which one happened first? Mine or yours? The oh, total mine. Pharma. Yours happened first? Remember, because the, the best story ever, right? Like, he's married. I'm with Andrew. And we <laughs> tell our partners, right? <laughs> right. And, and, and he tells his wife and I tell Andrew and we're very transparent about it. And, you know, while we have this deep emotional bond because we cannot control being so in love with each other, we also never kiss, never make love. Like there's a, there's a, let's hold this with integrity, but this is what's here. This is what's yeah. true. And I remember you being like, girl, I don't touch other people's property. And then you fell in love with the married oh. man. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, I'm not touching someone else's property, but I'm definitely coveting someone else's yeah. property. Like, let's be, let's yeah. be real. And I, and I think, you know, one of the things that I, I saw with both of us at that time was both of us went for it wholeheartedly. Yeah. Like with all our heart and heart. Like I didn't hold, not hold back on the love, on the enthusiasm. Like I fucking dove off that high down yes. hard with yeah. the strength of the boundaries that I was unwilling to cross. Yeah. Because of, we were dancing to OPP this morning. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Totally. Yeah. And I, I really, I, I love that about our experience because I think that you can be um, filled with integrity even when your heart is exploding with love and lust. Totally. And with the choices that you make. And I think that's how you kind of honor all the circumstances and in the highest and the best way. Yeah. But- I remember that I was actually here at your house the very day that you broke up with Andrew. And I spent a few hours in bed with the two of you crying. Yeah. Uh, and that was a, a very remarkable day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I had that mind-blowing activation. I also had enough wherewithal to be like, don't just chase the shiny new thing. Like, let's ride this out. Yeah. And it was this beacon it was this lighthouse from the universe of right. like it's possible right. it's right. possible to feel this way it's possible to connect yes. this way and and for me and yeah. and this man it wasn't just energetic we also met each other very deeply spiritually we held yeah. each other we showed up for each other mm -hmm. there was there was this seeing of each other where right. it was like whoa like we mm -hmm. were these divine mirrors for each other it was yeah. so sacred and i was like i'm not gonna leave andrew for someone else like you, you just can't do that but in that process, as I turned towards my relationship with Andrew, I was like, it's not my truth to stay in this anymore. Mm -hmm. And yes, when we started to uncouple, we were really with each other. And I remember that we were 
howling in bed, like howling, howling. with grief. And you and yeah. Annie were holding us. Yeah, and it was, we were. it was so beautiful to be held in that and so fucking tragic. And uh, yeah. And so in that, you were still on your ride I of was. being so into this other man. Mm -hmm. And you ended things with Peter. And I would say, you know, upon reflection, what both of these men did for us, the, the shiny gold glittery object that fucking <laughs> exploded into our lives and hearts, um, was both of us got a kind of radical love activation. That is right. A kind we of totally radical did. love activation. It was totally radical love activation and wholehearted as wholehearted. well. We were a thousand percent willing to do whatever the fuck it took to show up for this and to also show up for really conscious uncoupling with our partners yep. in the most loving, transparent way. There is no, like Peter can recount to me now. He'll be like, I remember the first time that you met the man and you said to me, would it be okay with me if you went to have lunch with him? Yeah. And he really deeply appreciated like, that he was the first priority. Yeah. He was home plate. He was the person that I checked in with each step of the way. Yeah. And, uh, and, and he actually reported like to me, like, you know, now, um, m you know, over a year later, more, maybe almost two that, um, watching me say yes to the adventure of yeah. love yeah. was liberating for him him yeah uh just that raw enthusiasm and passion mm. that we both chose of like this is real this is happening we are not going to pretend this is any different we're sharing this mm. transparently as possible with our partners mm. and going for it at the same time mm. and i think that's super important like that's an element of uh loving the masculine mm which is really key because I think many women, at least me, I held out. Mm. I didn't say that divine a thousand percent yes mm. until this opportunity with the short-lived uh, crush. Here. <laughs> well, when you were in it, you would have, you would have said that it was deep, deep, deep love. Now here's the interesting thing, right? Like it, it didn't work out for us with, with either of these men, but, yeah. and here's what people forget. I think, I feel like we both kept the transmission of my yep. heart can be that open. Yes. I remember yes. you totally. saying in moments, yeah. I love him so much that I will show up for this no matter what. Like that's how radical yeah. my love is. Yeah. And there were elements of such radical love in my situation. Like my guy, well, the first time he met me in person, kept one of my hairs and put it on his altar. And I was like, should I, should I talk about that? Is that weird? And Annie <laughs> was like, that's the level of devotion that your partner should have for you. Yeah. He should absolutely put parts of you on his altar yes. to worship. And she goes, and maybe this is just level one. And maybe the next man builds a Taj Mahal with your hair, like a, yeah. ta like a whole Taj Mahal yeah. around your hair, you know? Yeah. And like, what is possible? And I felt that like I, I wrote love letters and I was going to give him the book when we got to be together. Like, it was just like this the level of devotion that you mm. and I have in mm. our lives, which is why we do mm. our work, our level of devotion mm. to women, our level of devotion mm. to pussy, mm. our level of devotion mm. to the goddess, right? right. It's this fueling Fuel. mystic. Like, it, oh. Totally, totally. And we were fully engaged in it. And I always felt like in my relationship with Peter, I wasn't. No. As fully, and you were not with Andrew. No. So that was the liberation for us. It didn't even have to do with these guys, yeah. obviously. It was like liberating the fullness of who we are yeah. as women, as spiritual beings, yeah. as uh, uh, just like, you, you know, the, the, something about my divinity and my love, my lust, my fullness just got liberated. Yeah. And that was the feeling that I was in love with yeah. was my own liberation that, I was that like, has happened. I don't, I've never felt as much myself as when I am a mystic fool in service exactly. of love. Exactly. And I know that yes. in other parts of my yes. life, but I never let myself have that with a man because yes. I felt too scared. Yes, exactly. 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 So even already, our prayers are already being answered 
in, in a way, even though it wasn't the form that we either expected, anticipated, or longed for at that particular time. But right now, I just want to say, I'm so relieved <laughs> that it didn't turn into anything more than it did. <laughs> For both of us. Well, because for you, right, your your situation ended, right? Because both yeah. of us were in emotional relationships, right. even if it wasn't sexual. Yeah. And uh, your situation ended. And literally, I think it was that very day you were like, I think I'm in love with Peter Sweeney. And I was like, let's, I was like, let's give I it a week. I remember. I was like, let's give it like, a week. You you're know? like, Regina, you know, keep your shirt on, sister. I was like, like okay, just this thing just imploded. Just because like, has opened doesn't mean you have to start spewing it all over. Peter, you know, <laughs> but here's, here's the thing. The reason that, uh, I reported that to you and because, and, and I, I was Peter while we uncoupled, he never lost touch with me. Yeah. Now, uh, I broke his heart, uh, in every kind of way a woman could break a man's heart. Like this was a guy who lived to serve me who wanted nothing more than my happiness. And I was like, you can't do that anymore. Mm. I'm done with you. I see a shinier thing. And mm. he did not let his hurt stop the love. Mm. And so he would, we would get together like every other week for a night mm. or go to the beach house for a weekend because we share a beach house. We, uh, he still planted the garden in the beach house. We spent a lot of time there together. Like, as friends, as lovers, while all this was happening, like he always had his hand at my back. And your pussy. He would come and give you orgasms oh, all queen. the time. Oh, queen, all the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I just want to say shout out to Peter Sweeney. There's nobody who has more incredible hands, who's more incredible attunement, who knows this body so well, who can just create so much sensation in this body. Like he is fucking amazing. He's been studying this work of art for six years now and he has got it down. So yeah. A little humor intermission. Like while you were like, like fueled in the fires of like overwhelming lusty love and desire, you at least were being serviced with all these orgasms. Thank you. I was basically celibate you or like were... basically masturbating. And I was like, why am I so bad at getting myself <laughs> orgasmic fulfillment? Like, ah, you were like the shining example of like that woman going to get her fill no matter what. And I was like, God. I'm so in love. And I, I basically got through two breaks. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I was trying to encourage both of us to put together our whore army, this series of men that would service us while we were in the midst of our transitions or whatever the fuck we were doing. And, uh, but, then yeah. my whore army all came together in like August. And I was like, whoa, it's too much. It's too much. Ah, what have I done? <laughs> True. It was a lot. It was fun to witness you. And then everyone started building their horror army. You said horror army. I know. And, and that's only everybody a wants a horror, horror army. army. Yeah. Like, you know, it's, it's and then a, we were picking generals and like who, <laughs> who would train the horror armies. It was like, man, summer of 2022. <laughs> exactly. It was a good summer. It was, it made life worth living. All um, right. So you get your crack, heart cracked open into like yeah. mystical devotional love. It's possible with masculine. Yeah. My heart gets cracked open. Mystical, devotional love yes. is possible with the masculine. Yes. Peter Sweeney's still there. Yes. What happens then? Okay, so what happens then is he's, of course, started to date and take all these different classes. Like, he never stops working on himself because mm. that's Peter. Mm. Um, and uh, I can start to feel, because I have these parties once a month called courtesan parties, and he's always invited because mm. uh, all my girlfriends love him and I love him. And so one time he shows up at this courtesan party and it's like, who the fuck is he? Mm. He's so smoking hot. Mm. You could just feel him in his masculine in the way I had always longed for. Mm. And he's showing up like that. Mm. And I'm like, whoa, that is insane. Mm. And so it kind of opened this little portal with us. And then we started to see each other a little bit more. And then we started to have a few weekends at the beach together. And then somehow I, somebody suggested uh, that we do MDMA together mm. one weekend. Was that I, you? I don't know if 
that was me, but I would like to f- take some level of responsibility you for your awakening into yeah. psychedelic exploration. <laughs> no, you <laughs> have an extreme <laughs> contribution to me, <laughs> introducing to me to many new worlds of experiences <laughs> that went beyond anything I'd ever experienced. Yes, and thank you. They've all been magical and continue to be. So, yeah, so I was, because of you, I was open to the yes mm. for that. and. Somehow a really good friend of ours kind of set us up and Annie uh, created a ritual for us and we uh, did MDMA. Mm. It was the first time I ever did it, not as a party drug, but as a one-on-one experience. Mm. And literally from the minute that uh, that substance interfaced with my body, which it, I understand it's used uh, very often for healing from PTSD, mm. which I definitely had, that I didn't really recognize the depth of PTSD that I had as a result of the abuse from my childhood. It melted something inside of me where my heart and my pussy were in bed with the same man. Mm. Oh my God, for the first time in my entire life. And this was the amazing part that was like so 3D, 4D, 5D. When I would touch him or he would touch me, I was touching five, at that time, five years of devotional love. Mm -hmm. I was touching the body of the man who never stopped loving me, Mm -hmm. even when I loved another. Mm -hmm. I was touching the... Uh, kissing, opening my heart, my pussy to the man Mm. who never stopped loving me, never stopped showing up for me. The man who had seen me through so much with my daughter, with my family, with, uh, you know, who built this beach house for me, for fuck's sake. Like it was almost like I just like I was weeping Mm. with gratitude that I had made it through to this moment that my whore and my heart were one, Mm. and that I could open fully, sensually to Peter in a way that I had never, ever, ever opened to any man. And Mm. it was astonishing. And we ended up spending like literally 12 hours just connecting centrally. We just did not want to leave the bed. We did not want to do anything but just be together, touch each other, kiss Mm. each other, make love with each other, just talk, 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 you know. And then finally, I think, we went to sleep and then I always wake up early to journal. And I remember sitting down and journaling to try to capture what had happened and then realizing like, oh, fuck, my, my heart is still open. Yeah. And then I like snuck upstairs and got, with a coffee for Peter and he opened his eyes and he looked at me and I, I was just like, heart is still open. Can you believe it? And he was just like laughing and we ended up spending like literally the next two, two days in bed together. Yeah. Like just like all of the love, all of the sex, all of the polarity, all of that erotic aliveness suddenly was there. And mm-hmm. I could not, I could not believe like the, uh, and, and he was even, he was even like grateful. He was like grateful that I had fallen in love with the other dude. He was like, I would never have this. Like, thank God your colleague came out and, you know, cut off what that was because I would still be in my pleaser. There are so many women that would have never let me go because a pleaser would be enough. Thank you for allowing this transformation. Like he was, he got the whole thing right Mm -hmm. there. It was insane. Mm -hmm. And it was literally uh, without a shadow of a doubt, aside from giving birth to my daughter, which was insanely fun. It was like, the best experience of my entire life. Mm. It was everything that I longed for. Mm. It was the thing that people, I guess, long for or strive for when they get proposed to or get married, but I'd never been able to taste or touch that. It wasn't until this that I got to feel like, oh my God, Mm. I am deeply, desperately, irrevocably, ecstatically Mm. in love with this man and mm. I am able to live it. I'm utterly surrendered to it. And it was like, wow, I was born for this moment in time. Mm. So grateful. 
And I think probably the biggest key, right, is you could find Peter so right. Yes. And you could feel, yes, he did his work. Yeah. He evolved your alchemy, evolved mm-hmm. the both of you in the direction of being able to have that level and depth of love and arrows together. And it's like you can only feel divine masculine with your heart, like true heart. And yeah. without that, you can't see a man. No way. No way. I could not. Like without my heart that open, my pussy that open, and and all I wanted to do was serve him. Mm. And that's all I want to do now. Like, I just want to serve him in any way that I can, in mm. all the ways, like, mm. like literally from the core of my being and the entire, f- what we call phase one mm. of our relationship. I just was caring about being served. Mm. And now I, I just, I don't, he's already given me so much. I just want the privilege of serving him, you know, and he's unbelievably generous with me still, but I, it, that's all I want. Yeah. I just want to make his life amazing, great, be of service, be subservient to his powerful masculine energy, mm. just do whatever he wants, mm. whenever he wants it. Mm. It's so pleasurable. Mm. And I think peace too that I've seen, right? Because it's it's unknown at this point. I mean, I, I believe that you two will end up together and, you know, we don't we don't know for sure. We don't know. And in that, I feel like so many people, I've been afraid of continuing to evolve. Like, what if I evolve beyond anyone's capacity yes. to, to meet me? Yeah. What happens if I open so into this person and they leave? Yeah. But what happens is you get the transmission, right, of, well, this is, this is how I love from now on. Yeah, this is how this I love from now on. This is how I fuck from now on. Exactly. And it becomes you, your it DNA. It becomes you. And that's yeah. what you're magnetic to. Yeah, exactly. And it's also like, it's changed the way I relate to everybody in my life. Yeah. My kid. Has it changed the way I relate to you? Yes. I mean, you're, you're, you're definitely, uh, let me put it this way. I feel like you and I have always had a true heart-based relating Mm -hmm. and that you tried to resist my charms very early on. You were like, (laughs) I don't do eye gazing and that (laughs) hippie shit and all the spirituality. And then I remember actually you took uh, Molly at one of my parties and you were like gazing into my eyes and I was like, oh, look now. <laughs> I remember so that. Open. And you were like, we're not calling it eye gazing. It's eye whoring. You're that's eye whoring. <laughs> and I was like, that's right. And guess who loves it? Guess who loves the eye whore? <laughs> I think there was something always so eternal and beautiful and true about our relating that yeah. I feel like I... I feel like you always showed up with more of your true heart with me. Yeah. That it you didn't agreed. have to be so guarded with yeah, me. Yeah, I agree. And that that has been part of our journey, actually. Yeah. Like being in that much love, in that much trust, in that much care, in that much yeah. safety yeah. as well with each other helps mm-hmm. imprint what's possible mm-hmm. with others and a man. Yeah. I feel for you, your radiant sparkle. I can feel Peter's alchemy in mm-hmm. you. I can feel your... So much hotness and beauty like increasing in like unbelievable ways because you're coming yeah. home to yourself yeah. your sexuality yeah your pussy your heart your magnetism yeah and it's kind of beautiful to me that i don't think things fundamentally changed with us because somehow we were always in our hearts with each other yeah true all right so now i want the catch up of you to this part like okay <laughs> because you are about to leave for a big adventure with a man <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So I felt in 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 the demolition of my relationship with Andrew and the demolition of the relationship with the other man and and he always kept open the, the deep possibility and I knew that I had to let go. Um and double heartbreak, long covid, all the things and it basically <laughs> had the universe I would say shoved me into like, like, like I, you're not going to get what you say you want until you are an actual match for it. Mm-hmm. And my unworthiness, my projecting onto the masculine was still holding me back in so many ways. So I just went on like a worthiness bender. I was like, I'm going to like own my worthiness, own my power. I'm not going to make what a man does to me 
shake my own sense of self-worth to the core like it used to. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not going to let whether a man is a yes to me or not be the defining factor about whether I think I'm an ugly cretin or not or worthy or not or all of that. And so like somehow people are always like, what work did you do? And I was like, I just made it the intention and just, you know, I did tantric coaching. I did love coaching. I did uh, therapy. I did literally everything I could get my hands on. And I was like, this is it. And I, I would say too, like, how did our hearts open? There was a deep unabiding intention to have true love. That's right. You know? Yeah. Like show me true love. Right. And it wasn't like open my heart, but it was like, I want to know true love. Mm-hmm. I'll do whatever it takes. Mm-hmm. And the mm-hmm. universe was like. Oh. Why I think that's really important to say is because it, everything with a woman begins with desire. Mm. And desires are kind of like the roadmap of our lives. Mm. They never look like where you think it's going to take you. It mm. always breaks you. Mm. and then remakes you, and then breaks you, and remakes you. But the only way to get there is to just be really connected with that which you long for. Mm. So we were always being broken and remade, broken and remade. And you went through uh, like a an astonishingly, unbelievably brilliant and beautiful Rolodex of men <laughs> over the summer, <laughs> uh, many of whom I met. I think, did I meet all of them? Uh, no, not all of them, but a he lot met, of the key players. I met a lot of them. Yeah, lot yeah. of them. Yeah. Um, and here you are uh, uh, experiencing a side of yourself in love that I've never witnessed with you before. It's so beautiful and cute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, I became magnetic. I became a match to what I really wanted. And I yeah. would say the relationship right before this was really in that direction of like deep, long-term spiritual practitioner, Uh much more self-responsible in communication, lots of depth, lots of vulnerability, Mm -hmm. and this quality of being really met as a tantrika. Yeah. And it wasn't quite it for me. And, and so this thing that, that I'm, I'm in now, um, it is, it is a deep match of my whole being. Yeah. And I couldn't even conceive of that before an intellectual, spiritual Mm -hmm. playmate, courageous, kind, heart of gold, epically erotic, like tantric match. Yeah. I'm just like, what? And there's a level of worthiness that I had to get to, to A, allow myself to have that. And B, it had to feel safe in my nervous system Mm -hmm. to have that much love, that much connection, that much depth. And C, I've noticed that I wouldn't have been able to keep this relationship on track if not for my radical mystical heart. You know, I found myself in moments, you know, where he would push me away or go into fear. And before, because of my insecurity, because of my unworthiness, because of Mm -hmm. my closed heart, it would hurt so much that I would just collapse. I would attack him. I would destroy the relationship. I would move on. I would do whatever. Right. And this time I felt so insane, but in like open hearted, like mystical crazy where I was like, I have never met anyone like you or experienced this before. You have never met anyone like me or experienced this before. You want me to go away? You're going to have to try so much harder. And like, but I meant it in the core of my being. Like, yeah. It's like, I wouldn't get scared and derailed like mm-hmm. before. I would go in even more. And part of that is just the quality of our love. Part of that is the trust in it. Yeah. And part of it is that I, I open my mystical heart to being able to really see a man. So I... I operate from a different Mm -hmm. vibration now. Mm -hmm. It's not like, am I worthy or unworthy? Are you going to stay or go? Those still run. Those are still like whatever, like malware software that's uploaded into my system. But the predominant code that I'm running is like, this is the most fucking beautiful thing in the universe and I will do whatever it takes to protect it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I see that in you. Uh, It's beautiful to see because like what I've seen is that you built a sense of resilience mm. inside of your woman, mm. which I think is not just important for, um, let's say, this courtship phase, but I think as women we need to locate that sense of resilience because our beloveds, our partners are going to trigger the fuck out of us mm. on 
outgoingly. Mm-hmm. And that's why I was really touched when you read me the text he wrote you the other day where he was like, I know I'm going to be triggered, whether it's five minutes or five hours or five days, but I'm going to take responsibility and I'm going to do my work and I'm going to yeah. show up. Yep. You know, because that's, that's like, that's a mantra, not just for the man, but for each of us, like mm-hmm. each of us showing up to do the work, which I think, Layla, I think it's the only way we get to do that deep reckoning work of healing those wounds Mm. because you finally have gotten to a place. Mm. And I would say I have also finally gotten to a place where we love a man more than we love our wounds. Mm -hmm. We love a man more than we love the, the heartbreak Mm -hmm. that we, you know, the, uh, that would, that, came with us, Mm -hmm. you know, that had nothing to do with them, Mm -hmm. but it's so triggering. Mm -hmm. And I think until you find that way where there's, there's actually somebody that you love more than yourself or your desires, uh, it's, uh, then you're, then you're not really living that, um, deep and profound, ever evolving, life-changing, cell-changing, love story that for you and I was our deepest heart's desire. Yeah. Like I want true love more than I want my story. Yeah, exactly. And I want true love more exactly. than I want my pain. Yeah. And I don't really care anymore what happened in 1986. Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather live than now, you right. know? And right. it takes so much work to get there. It and takes we're gonna so talk much about work. That in the, the, in our upcoming episode of, of what practices right. and tools and technology we actually use right. to get there. Mm-hmm. But I think something that's important for me to say, you know, as we start to wrap this conversation is I think a lot of people out there in kind of the polarity spiritual world would look at us and say like, oh yeah, like you had a problem with men because you were so masculine, right? Like mm-hmm. out there building and doing and crushing and all of the things. And it's like, it's like, I would say it's not that we were in our masculine, it's that we were in our pain. And I think that's what gets very mistaken sometimes is the closure or Mm -hmm. the, the resistance is, is coming from pain and unhealed Mm -hmm. trauma. And Mm -hmm. when you do the work on that pain and that trauma, and Mm -hmm. we've done a lifetime of work on ourselves, this radical new possibility uh, starts to emerge. And one of the things that I tracked was a lot of my girlfriends who were in partnerships with men that I respected. They all had really happy childhoods. Right. They had beautiful fathers. Yes. They knew they were loved. Yes. And they had this kind of glow to them yes. of like goodness yes. and beauty. And God. they could look at a man and like they would have yeah. joy and happiness when yeah. a good man came along. Yeah. You know? Whereas like yeah. I'd be like, the fuck is going on? You know? Yeah. And so I watched them and at first I had real bitterness. I was like, those bitches haven't been through hell. I've been through hell. Fuck them. You know, or like yeah. and then I went through like a kind of tragedy with the universe, like, woe is me. Like, yeah. are they the ones who are just gonna have happy relationships yeah. and I'm forever doomed because my dad sucked, blah, 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 mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. And then eventually I was like, and this is what makes us teachers really, or, or at least grand experimenters of life. I was like, all right, if, if they can have it, then that consciousness exists. Yeah. And it might be harder for me to get there, but that's what I want. That and is I studied right. them. And I was that's like, right. I want that mm-hmm. transmission yeah. as though father loved me. Right. As though father would never leave. Yeah. So father would always protect me. Yeah. What would it look like to love a man if my nervous system was set at that? And one of the things that I realized was as long as my nervous system was relating to Mm -hmm. dad, I would never be able to see the man in front of me. I would only be able to see Mm -hmm. the legacy of dad's wounding. And as long as I needed to heal through dad, I would just keep perpetuating those wounds over and over again, hoping they would heal. And one of the things I finally realized was the only way the same way that you and I constructed ourselves, not out of the, like out of the ashes of what we inherited from our mothers and grandmothers, but we didn't look at every other woman and decide what we could be. We self-sourced from goddess divinity within us. That's right. And grew what mm-hmm. was possible of woman from mm-hmm. the blueprint of divine genius. Mm-hmm. And that's the, the, the core of so much mm-hmm. of our work that's been right. so impactful. And I was like, what would it look like to source divine masculine or the man in front of me from the blueprint of that mm-hmm. divine masculine wisdom, mm-hmm. let go of the dad wounds mm-hmm. so much and, and, mm-hmm. and free base, some drug reference, free- <laughs> go straight to the line of the, the divine masculine and see a man through that lens. And that to me is what gave me so much hope that even without this dreamy childhood, 
right, which neither you or I got, that we could actually get to a place of worship, of finding a man truly white, right, of being met heart, pussy, and spiritually as Mm -hmm. well. So sacred. And so us in that journey to me, it's not like, oh, well, we're these like leaders of these movements. So we finally made it. It's like, no, we're these little girls who got so fucked with and so wounded. Mm. And we have access to Mm. so much technology and so much support. Mm. But the fact that we were able to do it means Mm -hmm. that that roadmap exists and therefore Mm -hmm. it's possible for anyone. Absolutely. And it it also, for me, required a deepening of my own spiritual, like actually feeling, feeling into that which is greater than me, like something bigger than, uh, you know, like deepening my relationship with God goddess, the universe, like resting in his or her arms and Mm. trusting that, which is really hard to do when you've been injured, betrayed uh, by by a real masculine presence or a real feminine presence, but it is worthy. It is worthy. And I, uh, and, and I'm, I can't even tell you (laughs) the joy that it brings me to see you where you are now. Like how many hours have we caught each other in the vomiting and the crying and the (laughs) spring cleaning and the swamping and the wondering, would we ever, you know, and then to see this woman before me, It is so fucking good. It is so fucking good. Well, on that note, I was going to invite us to conclude by bragging for each other. Ooh. Oh, wow. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh-huh. All right. Let's do that. Uh-huh. Let us do that. All right. Should we go? Like, we'll switch out, switch it off a bit? Yeah. Okay. We can do one or the other. All right. Regina. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have known you to already be so outrageous, so audacious, so in like claiming of your pleasure and your orgasmic fulfillment, right? You could have rested on your laurels, stayed in a (laughs) (laughs) nice, reasonably fulfilling relationship or just given up, right? Like I know on some level that that giving, giving up was not like super like 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 there's just something in you that has to go for gold and glory and yet you still could have given up and there was so much to face so much to feel so much to overcome and i watched you every step of the way act with integrity and love and fierceness and still be so like unexpressibly yourself through the whole entire process and to live every wave that came your way to ride it even if it brought you so much pain or so much terror or so much fear and I watched you do that all the way to allowing yourself to have something that is so rarely touched on this planet your full heart and your full pussy open in devotion with a man who is in such deep devotion to you and (laughs) (laughs) it's true I brag that for you because it's just like I've wanted that for you so much yeah yeah and you got there yeah you did whatever it took totally whatever it took totally totally and you took whatever ride was in front of you Mm mm-hmm And some of them were so painful and so outrageous Mm. and so fucked Mm. up. And you never stopped going. No. Until you got there. True. Yeah. So true. Okay. Thank you. I totally let that in. I feel that in every cell of my being. You are fucking right. That is the truth. And it is so deeply pleasurable to Mm. be me Mm. owning that part of my relentless passion and enthusiasm and mm. never quitting. Yes. It's so, it's, I, I, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to be this woman. Um, I, w- I want to shout you out for, I have never in my fucking life seen anyone as relentless about owning her beauty mm. and reclamating her beauty mm. as you. Mm. You, you like, looked at it 
you're like, I'm going to tame this bitch. Mm. I'm going to own every single cell of my being. I'm going to own my radiance, my power, my absolutely delicious, incandescent, Mm. eternal Mm. beauty. And I am going to claim that. And I watched you crawl through fucking glass. I watched you get (laughs) so knocked down. Mm. I watched you through illness. I watched you through like how many illnesses, cold (laughs) sores, dies in your eye, like, like, you know, beyond belief circumstances that would have felled any other human being, Mm. but have you decide, okay, great pussy, (laughs) you've thrown down the gauntlet. I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to fall relentlessly in love with myself. Mm. And I'm going to do that. And I watched you do it like week after week because you're public person so I could watch whatever thing you were putting out and I'd be like well look at her (laughs) oh there she is Mm. oh there she is Mm. and with each passing gentleman caller that (laughs) came through your world I would see oh no he is bringing forward a quality of her beauty that she has Mm. not yet inhabited look at her inhabiting that well, look at her inhabiting that and look at her inhabiting that. And you just, you know, continually grow into that space Mm. and it's changed you. Mm. It's changed you to the cell, to the depth of your being because you love yourself the way a newborn baby loves herself or a little baby. Like if you ever see a baby in the, looking at themselves in the mirror, they find themselves so enchanting. (laughs) And like watching you looking yourself in the mirror is as enchanting as watching a baby do the very same thing. And that's the highest praise <laughs> because that's loving the goddess in you. So congratulations on loving the goddess in you and letting her breathe and mm. live so powerfully. Mm. Mm. Inspo queen. <laughs> inspo, inspo, inspo. I brag for you that part of what gave your nervous system the support and the resource to be as bold as you have been Uh in love and in life was your courageous willingness to like eat the world with your whole pussy. Like when I met you, you were a little like not so satiated with your community, with your social life. And in everything that I invited you to be it like a play party or some outrageous international adventure or some new psychedelic you'd never tried. You were like, is it ketamine? (laughs) (laughs) N-D-N-A? No, not that. (laughs) Yes to NDAs. And uh, (laughs) you so boldly just like ate everything. There was, there was, it was such a cosmic yes to whatever the goddess put in front of you. Yeah. That's been true in love. That's been true in community. Mm -hmm. That's been true in sisterhood. That's been true in partying. Mm -hmm. It's just like a cosmic yes to such a huge expansion. Mm -hmm. And I feel like because you expanded to let that much more pleasure in, that much more joy in, that much more delight in, you also prepared your nervous system to be able to take one of the most courageous leaps of your life. Absolutely. Thank you for that. So true. Mm. And thank you for all of the, like, you literally were like opened banquets for me and I could not appreciate it more. So gorgeous. And I, I want to really, uh, I want to shout you out for this, for being willing not to stint on whatever the fuck emotional range, emotional trigger, like you never, like literally have I ever met anyone who vomits as frequently as you, who <laughs> falls into insane tears, like insane laughter, like you gave yourself fully and emotionally, like literally to the experience. Like if you had to grovel through glass for 10 days with no shower, with like shit all over you, you were willing to do it to live the fullness of your raw emotional truth unstintingly with full passion and fierce fire, trusting yourself Mm. that in living fully, you would get 
everywhere you needed to go to have the life experience that was yours to have. Mm -hmm. You are brave as fuck, courageous as fuck, and unstinting in your passion and Mm -hmm. enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And I love that about you. It is so inspiring and so beautiful. And it's the only way there. Mm. There are no shortcuts. Mm. There are no shortcuts. If if there is a tear that is not cried, it will lodge in your heart and keep you from the fullness of your love. Mm. And you let no tear stay lodged. You were like, I'm going <laughs> to cry this fucking shit and do it again and again and again, whatever I have to do mm. to open myself to love. So mm. yes to you, leaping off the high dive over and over and over and over and over again relentlessly. Mm. Mm. Uh, My final brag for you is I remember this like turning point when you really realized how much you loved Peter Sweeney. Mm. And it was through your own heart where you were like, I don't care about all the superficial bells and whistles of life. Yeah. I care about love. I care about connection. I care about mm-hmm. intimacy. I care about the environment. I care about people. And you have one of the biggest hearts and most deep, true, compassionate impulses mm-hmm. of any human I've ever come across on this planet. Your heart is so massive. And that through your own heart beauty and owning what that was for you and how much it shaped your true values. It's like you could see the true love of Peter Sweeney. Yeah. Everything that he'd always done, every yeah. way that he always showed up for you. Yeah. And uh, that heart was so uh, defended because yeah. of your childhood. And to do all of the work so that mm-hmm. you could experience the depth of your heart, love the man in front of you, and also stop denying a man the most incredible privilege of being at your side. Yeah. Like you offer everything in partnership. Yeah. And to finally truly make yourself available of that for that through the power of your heart i i brag that for fucking lifetimes i feel like you'll be on the ride of true heart for lifetimes now Mm -hmm. thank you thank you for that and i love him so much it just keeps growing and getting bigger and it's such a pleasure Mm. um i want to shout you out for like let's say this was um, you know, let's see, there was, mm-hmm, and then, mm-hmm, and then, mm-hmm, and then, like probably four guys over the last few months. And in every single case, that way you showed up for each of them mm. was as if they were the king of your heart, body, mind, and soul. You showed up fully ready to give it all, to bring it all, to surrender it all until the moment where you're like, okay, all right, this is, this was enough of this one. (laughs) And you allowed the guy that you're currently with the space to display his devotion to you while you were living your fullness with experimenting with all the other guys. And now you have met him there Mm -hmm. and you have matched him in your devotion Mm -hmm. to him. Mm -hmm. And I think it was so unbelievably clever of you to actually have all the other experiences because it allowed him to reach for you (laughs) and to express his fullness Until you were ready to be like, okay, I'm ready for you now. Mm. I am ready for you now. And I just love that it's like he smeared this delicious elixir of love all over you. And you're just radiant in, in his, in his love and the love you hold for him. It's beautiful to see. And I'm so glad I got to meet him. (laughs) First night. You were there the first night we met. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, I am here to interrupt your regular podcast journey and let you know about something that I think is outrageously amazing. And this is my Vita coaching certification. This is a one year professional certification in a tantric approach to sex, love, and relationships. So basically you get to self-pleasure your way to being an incredible high paid 
coach. And if you feel called to be a sex, love, or relationship professional to guide other people in this incredible and expanding field, this program is literally like It's the best, I'm just gonna go ahead and say that. It's so good. So it trains you in science, it trains you in mysticism, it uses the most up-to-date research backed practices to be able to transform your nervous system, to be able to integrate trauma in healthy ways, to be able to come home to yourself in the way that you relate, uses the most potent tantric and sacred sexuality tools to unlock your sexuality, to be able to teach you how to experience and then teach others how to experience the most incredible sexual experiences with your lovers and in your relationship. So we take you through an extensive personal training so that you can coach with confidence that you have been through the process yourself and that you hold the transmission of higher sex, love, and relationships. We then certify you in our unique methodology called the VITA methodology, which uses very specific techniques and very specific ways of training you to be able to get laser-focused results for your clients. And then we also certify you in everything from breath work and energy work and using meditation practices and working with all kinds of different powerful transformative tools to accelerate the pace at which your clients get results. We then have a full business training to show you how to make money online and how to be able to get clients in a heart centric way that feels good for you, how to make content that really speaks to people in online platforms. And finally you get to major. So we have nine different majors on different topics. And what that does is it allows you to become a specialist in the field. So the majors are female sexuality, male sexuality, relationship transfer, tantric sexuality, conscious dating, crystal egg, life transitions. It's really fun because it allows you to then really dive into what you're most passionate about. And if you join the Vita Coaching waitlist to get notified about the program, we'll give you an extra major for free. So if you're going to join the waitlist and you want to learn more about the program, head over to laylamartin.com forward slash Vita Coaching. That's V-I-T-A coaching. And if you're too lazy to remember that, or you just don't want to, which I'm that way, you can go ahead and find the link down below in the show notes. (laughs) All in a day's work for Sister Goddess. (laughs) Yay! What else are we going to do with our lives? (laughs) She literally, like, Regina stopped me in my tracks because I was, like, walking to do the podcast out in the hall, and I thought I might die on my heels because I fell down on my heels. (laughs) In the first podcast and then in this one my stockings were like slippery on my heels so I was like tottering and I was just like oh god don't like break your ankle and her she was so hot that I literally like stopped worrying about dying and was like whoa you were oh my god me. isn't that the purpose of yeah. the feminine is to like be so hot that you actually have people stop worrying about dying <laughs> Totally. Or like go straight into like the center of death. (laughs) Either way is good. Either way. (laughs) But it's really fun to be able to devastate someone with your beauty. And it has nothing to do with how you look. It has to do with how you feel. Mm. So if, if nothing else today, I just hope that we liberate women into understanding that they are devastatingly beautiful. Yes. No matter how they feel about themselves, actually, they are devastatingly. I, I have never seen a naked woman that did not totally bring me to my knees. Once we take our clothes off, we're like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> it's so much power. I've never seen any human in their essence that hasn't had a kind of arrows uh, or beauty or sexual power. That's and I so true. I think that's something like one of the really toxic, pervasive beliefs in our society is that arrows and erotic pleasure only belong to people of a certain age or who yeah. look a certain way. And yeah. it's like, that's, yeah. so, it's, it's not only messed up, but it's wrong. Cause it's I know, wrong. and you know, and working wrong. with so many people, yeah. the level of sexual and erotic fulfillment that's literally available to uh, everyone. It's so true. It's very liberating once you catch that. So I just, uh, l- let's make sure that everyone catches a whiff of that today because it would be, we'll set a lot of pussies and cocks free, baby. And we want to do that. Yo, liberated <laughs> Yes, All right. Do. Okay. <laughs> so let's get down to business. Let's do it. Which is that over the last couple of years through our sisterhood, we have crawled out of what I would call like a karmic hole. A karmic hole. You know, hole. Mm-hmm. where our experiences of trauma, yeah. our conditioning yep. around the masculine, mm-hmm. our own um, pain bodies, our own limiting beliefs mm-hmm. kept us uh, lower 
than our soul's truth around relating to men, around divine sacred union yeah. and partnership. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like we like it was like 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 I don't know if you were in the same, but like we were, like we, like we were in holes that where we could hear each other. Right? Yeah, we like could. We were like in a rat hole. Yeah, totally. That's how I've described it. Yeah, and we could like like yell to each other. Yeah, and yeah. encourage each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. like I would say, like as I was clawing my way out, and my hands were like getting all bloody, and I was like, oh, can I do this? Should I just give up now? Should I go back? <laughs> like you would call and offer me a tool or I a call. practice. I would have called and offered you a tool. And I think the first one. <laughs> and I would know, keep going. Yes. I'd be like, even though I have a bloody hand, <laughs> I can do it. Yeah. And I think the first tool that we both rocked the shit out of was swamping. Yeah, sure did. That was it. Yep. That was it. Because I have endless playlists on my Spotify that say Layla Swamp, Layla Swamp 2, <laughs> Layla Swamp 3, <laughs> Layla Swamp 12, because I would like create little immediate playlists depending on what was happening inside of our lives that I knew. Cause I, you know, being a DJ is probably my serious secret talent mm. and superpower, but I've never gotten to really fulfill that except in occasions like this, when I get to make playlists for friends, which I live for. But, uh, so like really super briefly, uh, swamping is a piece of technology that I teach in all my classes and my books, et cetera, where you get to embrace, Body, the feeling sense of darkness that wants to be felt, that wants to be lived, that we usually put a big ass lid on in an effort to be fine. Mm. Because when people say, how are you? Mm. That is all pretty much we are allowed to say. Mm. Fine, I'm fine, but we are never fine. There's no such thing as fine. There's just repression. Fine is the equivalent. It should say in the dictionary, <laughs> the definition for fine should be deep repression, cultural, <laughs> patriarchal uh, repression. But anyway, so that was like step one of liberation. At least uh, it was one of the most powerful liberations for me yeah. was learning how to embody every facet of my rage, my grief, my jealousy, my heartbreak, like all of it, all mm, of it, all mm, of it. Mm, mm, mm. And let's talk about how we put that into practice. I can think of like a few iconic swamps that we've had. Uh, Antarctica definitely comes to mind. Oh my god! Should we like like give a little like one hundred and one on the Antarctica swamp? Oh sure, let's go, let's go there. But it started before that. I think that we started to practice swamping live when we were in Nasara, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Which was a few months before Antarctica. I think we even did it earlier than that when we actually like truly swamped together. I also remember like you have this because you used to do it in garbage bags, right? Yeah, now no, totally. For, we did it in mastery when you you took mastery. And I like, but now for like ecological purposes, you have we, this swamp no more. outfit. And yeah. I remember you like sending me a photo. You have this like horrid tail thing and like <laughs> a horrific like tutu where it's just like like because yeah. the idea was that you kind of dressed like Here, the here's low a, vibration things that you okay. felt. How swamping started for me was um I realized like, you know, I, I was at, at this place, I was living in a commune with a, unbelievable people. It was like the happiest period of my entire life. And I would still wake up some days and I would be like this raging bitch from hell or just grief filled. And I wouldn't understand it. I'd be like, but I'm, I'm living how I want to live. Mm. I, 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 I love where I am, but I would have these like raging emotions. And, and my thought was, it was like when I was combining my study of the ancient goddess traditions with, you know, my sensuality practices and, and in the ancient goddess traditions, there was perfection in all things. Like there was no facet of life that wasn't perfect. Death was as perfect as birth was as perfect as, uh, uh sickness was as perfect as perfect health was as perfect as, you know, rain was as perfect as sunshine, like all of the perfection. So I thought if that is the truth, then there has to be perfection in all of those dark emotions. Mm. And I thought the only way I can feel the perfection of it is if I dress as I have to be, I have to embody mm. my darkness. So I, I threw a trash bag on and I wrote raging bitch from hell in a t-shirt across mm. my trash bag and um, just like taped it on there and uh, just walked around mm. so that my outside matched my inside. Mm. And I felt so fucking liberated. Mm. Mm. And then I ended up pouring that into the technology of one of my practices when I was teaching a few years later. And then I watched like how 
liberated women got when they, maybe some of them for the first time in their lives, we got celebrated for being like a fucking freak show of rage. You had like an audience clapping for you or a sisterhood saying, rock on, bring it, give me more. You are gorgeous in your raging bitch from hell. You are gorgeous in your grief. And I realized like every facet of woman wants to be honored. She wants to be seen. She wants to be loved. She wants to be welcomed. And when that happened, it transmutes. In fact, pour a little turn on into your darkness, whatever Mm. flavor it is. And it's actually transmutes into whatever the what's next is on your way towards your desires, Mm. which you cannot get to without embodying that. Mm. So it's like, no wonder there's so many women frustrated where like, I can't get what I want. I can't get the baby I want or the man I want or the job I want or the career I want because we're not allowing ourselves to break and remake So uh, it was so exciting for me to just experience how, shit, I can actually be in control Mm. by giving in to my truth. Mm. Like what's more powerful than that? Mm. So we, we started to do that and then we started to invite the guys in. And the thing that you're talking about in Antarctica, were you talking about that one where yeah, yeah. So, I about that. so we have a friend, Mickey, who, uh, Mickey Agarwal, she's fucking epic. epic. And uh, she, Amazing. she likes to invite people to all things uh, all, all the, the time. Things. So it's both all a superpower things. and sometimes horrifying. Yeah. Um, so it's Sometimes like, both. Sometimes both at the yeah. same time. And so we were planning the swamp and we were going to do it because we had these little cabins on yeah. this giant ship. We yeah. were going to Antarctica yeah. for 10 days and we were crossing the Drake's Passage and yes. there were like 40 foot waves. And so everyone's like a little afraid that we're going to die and yeah. kind of crabby and we were all yeah. stuck on a ship and all of that. So it was like, let's swamp. So we yes. like made a meeting time and we were all going <laughs> to swamp. And all of a sudden there were like three rando dudes that you didn't know, that you did not know. And they showed up. And at first, you rightly so had a bit of a like no, protectionism. I was like, I was like, Mickey, there's <laughs> no way. Like, this is my time. This is my swamp time with my girlfriends. Yeah. Like, I am not these three random men. I'm sure they're lovely. Yeah. But no. And you no. like brought your crush, you know, like, like she had brought her crush to swamp. Oh, that's right. She had. <laughs> that was the whole thing, wasn't it? Was it? The whole thing. It was the whole thing. It was point. a whole she thing. She had a big crush. It was a whole thing. So we, but then, you know, I looked at it and I was like, Regina, this is what is here. Yeah. It is time to surrender. So I thought, okay, this is you what I can do. You only do. looked at it that way after I talked to you. Oh, did like, you talk I me up the I was, I was basically like, come on. Like, I, I actually think like the, the breaking open. Breaking like, open. There's but a, yeah, yeah. I held out because yeah. I was like, I will swamp. <laughs> I will hold space for all you motherfuckers. Yeah. But I am not swamping. Yeah. There is no way I am going to swamp. But I will hold space. The good, caring individual that I am. So that's that's how I wrapped around it. And then we ended up having. First of all, I still remember your swamp that day. Yeah. Oh, you were like off the fucking chain, the walls, mama. Yeah. You were off yeah. the walls. I remember you. Let's like paint the picture too. We're in this tiny little cabin. Yeah, which is and basically we'll- a bed with a tiny aisle around it that you can barely fit a person in. Yeah, maybe it gets like a full, like a, a full to a queen kind of. Yeah. And so we all had to cram in between the yes. bed and the window that yeah. was like looking out into the yeah. Drake's passage. Yeah. And then we would, one person would swamp on the bed. On the bed. While the rest of us were crouched around in support. Yeah. <laughs> Blasting yeah. the music super loud. Yeah. And you were just, you were just like on a fucking terror. Were you the first swamper? I was. Okay. Yeah. And you just, you broke the room open. Yeah. Yeah. Was, I, I made a stand for the yeah. whole thing. So I was like, all right, I'm going I'm to go first. You know? Yeah. You did. And good. I did like a whole thing around being like, like, like being so powerful, being a high priestess, being a witch yeah. and like feeling men being afraid. Yeah. Not like in claiming yes. of that and the power of yes. that. And like just yes. this like raw frustration yes. and rage yes. of being like yes, yes, who yes. and what I am and being like, like, how can they be so scared of the thing they most want? Uh-huh. Exactly. And it was so gorgeous. And we were all in tears and clapping and the whole situation. And then we went through each person. And and here's the thing. Because of your courage in going for it so powerfully, everybody got the sacred download yeah. that they were to go yeah. for it. And then what happened was, you know, of course, Mickey went, Emily, who, uh, I, I can't remember. I think maybe it was just the three four of us and then the guys went yeah and that's when my heart blew open yeah. oh my god because these guys 
as if they were given a permission slip to themselves yeah. and to their aliveness and to be cheered and celebrated for their insane rage, yeah. frustration, yeah. anger, yeah. grief. I mean, it was like they were jumping off the walls, the ceilings, like fucking the bed, yeah. the, like it, tearing up that room. Like it was crazy. And it was so moving and was so incredibly moving because it was like, we are women holding space for the fullness of who and what a man is. And we're living in the hashtag me too mm. generation where men don't quite know what to do with their fullness. Yeah. They don't know what to do with that, of the full depth and breadth and wildness of them. And, and they're afraid that if they bring that to the feminine, they'll destroy her or get accused of being too much or taking advantage of her yeah. or overpowering her. Yeah. And so here we were women choosing to say, guys, give us everything that you have. And it was fucking holy. Yeah. Uh, and it was hot yeah. also. Like there, there was no, it was so, it was just like seriously hot. Like every single one of those men, I was so turned on yeah. to. And these are like, like alpha males in their career yes. and how they do the world and all this. And, they like broke oh God. open, sobbing, it was so raw. Uh, and then when they, t they like brought the arrows and got turned on, it was so hot. Oh God! It was just like raw wow. masculine emotion wow. and fuck. And you were like, we were all wet. We all also like fell in love with each other. Like, we did. It was just like Deeply. so raw and hot that it was like we're all getting married. Like yeah, that's the, that's the only. <laughs> like the only option left. Yeah. And it it actually broke open so many beautiful adventures to come yeah. because of how we held each other. Yeah. And then of course, once those guys went, I was like, okay, I'm going to swamp. <laughs> <laughs> and then you I sure just did. really got to tear it up. And, <laughs> and I got to two things, tear it up and I got held mm. by men and women. Mm. So once again, it just proves that Mickey is always right. Um, that's what <laughs> yeah, Mickey. Oh my God. There was another time too. I just want to kind of talk about how we bring it into our everyday yeah. lives. Right. Yeah. 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 So we were at Burning Man and <laughs> oh you my God. so graciously, uh, followed my lead because I wanted to camp at this one Playa Alchemist giant, yeah. giant pyramid. Right. Yeah. You all know that, uh, who know Burning Man and, uh, you know, like a tense, like a, a nice safari tent with AC. Yes. But like the power grid kept going off and we were right next to the like speakers. a sound camp. Yeah. So it's just like, boom, 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 all boom, night all night blazing hot starting at 8am because the AC was usually not working really dusty here. So like, yeah. co like coated in dust. I was just like, Oh man, I'm like a, like I am a seasoned burner. I did not ask enough questions about this. I'm so sorry. So we're like, you know, we ended up having like a fantastic burn, but we were in high point of suffering. Right. And yeah. I was in total despair. I was like, I have all these hot dates, yeah. like these amazing Kings, yeah. but I'm sobbing. Like yeah. I'm just sobbing and, yeah. and nothing's ever going to work out for me. Yeah. And I'm clearly going to die alone. And we couldn't take a shower either. No, we couldn't take the, a shower. Yep. Yeah. Cause there was no water because the, uh, all the <laughs> grit power grid was down. So, so you were filthy as you faced your Kings. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. But I was really committed. I was like, I'm using the baby wipes. I'm using the crystal geezer water bottles. I will do whatever it takes to clean this bitch, you know? So anyways, we were in like moment of despair. You were thinking of leaving because it was so no, shitty. No, I tried. Tried. It was like 9 a.m. It was getting almost too hot to be in the tent. Yeah. And then Blue came by. Blue came over. Blue had never swamped before. And she'd never swamped before. She lost her hearing aids. Yeah. She was... She too had had sleepless nights. Yes, because she, she was a tent right next to her. Yeah, so all of us were completely fried. We were fried, and we swamped. We swamped. So two of us sat on one bed, one tiny yep. bed, and we witnessed the yep. other one on the other bed. Like, yep. and the Burning Man bed is all like messy and dirty yeah. and all of that. And we stripped mm. and we cried and we cheered yes. for each other yes. and we owned it. And like I would say, yeah. on some level, we turned Burning Man around. Yeah, with that swamp. Yeah, absolutely. It, Turn blues burning man around. Yeah, she did. said like yeah, everything completely. was different for her after mm -hmm. that. I like mostly got my shit together. I held it together until like Saturday. So that got me through like five days mm -hmm. without like crying in the yeah. dust by myself. 
and you like like I feel like there was a renewed vigor I, on your part. I, from I had just, moments. Like, it. it was not my favorite <laughs> week of my life, but there were some memorable moments. <laughs> And the other one that really comes to me, so I was driving to Sedona. Oh, my God. With the horses in the field? And Well, okay. No, that was an asp. Oh, that was a different one. That was one of my favorite <laughs> moments of you. Because I was like, I called Regina crying in a dark field in Aspen. At, like, this amazing event. But I was, like, crying over some man. And this horse neighs and scares the shit out of me. It's it's pitch black. The dark, like, it's dark. A horse is, I was like, ah, the horse is neighing. Regina goes, Layla, horses are magic. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so I'm driving to Sedona. I remember. And I'm having man issues, boy problems, whatever. And I was like, I need to swamp. And I was driving on the highway. Yeah. And I swamped so hard and so deep. And like, I just like went yeah. for, I think that was like one of the deepest of the deep, like just like went all the way in it. And basically threw up in a paper bag yeah. while driving on the highway, yeah. which I don't recommend. Not safe. Don't do it. Whatever. This. It worked. For don't you. try it at home. I, I literally had to like throw up into a bag as you held me uh, on the phone as I'm like calling you and crying. And I remember afterwards you were like, that was a swamp to end all swamps. Yeah. We should mark this day on the calendar. Yeah. And we're going to give you an award yeah. <laughs> every year on this day <laughs> because of how intense your swamp was. And I was like, I'm such a bad bitch that I can swamp and barf in a bag and I don't even have to pull over on the side of the road. You know? like <laughs> That's right. That's right. Which is such a beautiful thing because it actually turns the culture on its head. Because the culture teaches us to be ashamed of mm. the depth and breadth of the way we feel yeah. and the way we love and the way we show up fully for our lives. And so if a woman can, and a man, if we can all turn that experience around. So we are so filled with delight when we feel deeply and we know like we are, and my dad used to have this expression. He would say, this is living kid. <laughs> And he would usually mean it, you know, because we went to some cool restaurant or this or that. But when you swamp well, that is living. Yes. And I, th I think about my daddy. Yes, because then you're, you've, you've, you've done it, you've processed it, you've integrated mm -hmm. it, you've turned it on. So yeah. carry it with you. And that's yeah. the thing, right? In so many relationships, if you don't have a swamping space, right. you can bring that right into your relationship. That How is could right. you not? That is right. So when we call each other or we show up and we mm -hmm. do that, it's like we're holding the the proverbial trash cans for each other to puke yeah, in. Totally. So we're not puking on the men in our lives. That is right. And I think that let's say we have been vigorous practitioners of this mm -hmm. and we've had so many endless swamps. And we are making so much insane progress, like that I've never made. Because like you you don't know this, but you're such a dream come true for me. <laughs> <laughs> because like, you know, when you are the creator of space, which I am, like I chose, I'm, I'm going to be like, I'm going to hold this fucking portal for women. Mm. So like, watch out world. Mm. This portal is going to be open. And when you, when you commit yourself to holding open the portal, yeah. it's like lonely at the top. Mm. You know, I didn't really have a sisterhood around me because I was holding space for women to sister. Mm. And honestly, I didn't really miss it until I did because it's such an honor to hold the portal open. Yeah. But when I wanted to really evolve in mm. my game and to be open to divine partnership and to really open my heart and my pussy. Like I wanted sistering and you stepped up and you were like, I'll sister you. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the moments, I mean, there were so many moments of falling in love with you, but I distinctly remember we had a hotel in the French oh, quarter right. in New Orleans. We went to do an <laughs> anti-racism training together Yeah, and uh, you wanted to learn sex magic. I did. And mm -hmm. so you showed up at my hotel room in your bathrobe. It was yeah. so like amazing. And I was still back then, let's see, that would have been 2019. Um, I was still lightly self-conscious, right? Like, like a little bit more like, oh, like, is she going to think I'm like hitting on hers? Is it going to be weird or whatever? And so I was like, you know, there's two options to do this practice. Like we're going to be self-pleasuring. Like we're going to be like working with energy. It's going to be really orgasmic. Um, like, it, like you could have the bed and I'll take the floor or we could both do the bed separate, whatever. Like, and you go, I want to do whatever's most fun. <laughs> I was like, this bitch is it. <laughs> so we were side by side on that bed. I can remember that. That was really, really fun. Really, really, really fun. 
<laughs> All right. So swamping, right? Holding that space mm-hmm. to process. Which you absolutely have to do. Okay. Anytime you're going for a desire, yeah. you're going to hit ruptures. Yeah. It's the nature of it. Yeah. And if you don't have a way of embodying those ruptures, mm. you ain't going to get your desires, mama. Yeah. You've got to. You have to continually g- give yourself. It's almost like... Uh, garbage collection. Yeah. You need to like, bleh, yeah. clear that out. And then the next load of stuff from your past needs to get processed. So it's, it's really useful. And then it keeps you kind of as tidy as you could possibly be in this messy world. <laughs> I also think like I let myself go farther and deeper because I know that there's a space for right. me with you. Right. You know, mm. that like yeah. if I need it and when it's hard, yeah. like I will have support yeah. in moving through it. And Having like paid space with professionals, there's there's no substitute for that. And you don't want to use your friends for that, but there's also no substitute for someone holding space for you out of love. Yeah. You know? And it's out really of true. communion and out mm-hmm. of true sisterhood. Mm-hmm. Like it's part of your mm-hmm. relationship. It's yeah. so beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And and me for you in in that way. It's just the best. It's the best because like you need those friends that can see your desire when you lose sight of it. Because, of course, whenever you have a swamp, Mm. you're swamping because you think, I'll never, ever, ever, ever find the love I long for Mm. or whatever it is you long for. Like you lose sight of being able to be the vessel in which that attracts that which you most long for and to stay in alignment with your God goddess or your flow state. So when you have a girlfriend standing for you saying, no, I see you. Of course, this is part of it. Yeah. This means that you're on the way. This means you're closer than you've ever been. It's so helpful. Totally. It's also like, I feel like one of the things that like, it's ironic, but what keeps us from getting our desire is our unwillingness to feel the fear or discomfort of not having the desire. Yeah. Right. We're actually so terrified of having it or not having it that yeah. we, we, that, that unintegrated emotion or experience keeps it in place. So mm-hmm. when you can go all the way there and be like, no, like I am going to die with 40 cats and they are going <laughs> to eat my face. And actually that would be like a positive outcome yeah. because it would mean I hadn't gotten so bitter that I quit my career and I could That's feed right. 40 cats, Yeah, you know? And like, you go like all the way there and yeah. just like, mm, yeah and yeah. then it's like oh like it's not so scary anymore right exactly you know? i like walked exactly. straight into the center of the fear yeah i embodied it and like okay let's do this you uh-huh. know uh-huh exactly and then you know that's kind of what gives you the chops mm. to actually live your most deeply held desires so it's it's a beautiful practice. So, but that was just like one of what we did. We had a lot of practices. Yep. Many. So then there was actually like, so I feel like we had swamp season. <laughs> it was just like, it, it was, was just heavy there for was a while. It like swamp two years? It was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> it was, I think it was swamp two years. Yeah. We had a little bit of sex magic in there. Oh, we like, did. Mostly we were swamping. So we'll talk about mm-hmm. sex magic. <laughs> and then I, I believe it was last summer. I like called you. I remember where I was. I was in Austin. I was about to get uh, Giardia. I had it in my system. But I didn't know how to get it. I was about to go to a really bad party. And I didn't know that yet either. I just come home from teaching my retreats. And I was dating this guy. And I was like, yo, like, like I got to get my, I got to get my vibration up. Like, it was like, it was, mm-hmm. it was heavy. I yeah. was like sobbing. I was in it. I was like cracking through layers of heart trauma. And I was like, Gina. I was like, can we brag? Yeah. Like every day? Yeah. Like every yeah. day? Yeah. And you were like, yeah. Great idea. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> because if you want to tune your instrument, there's nothing like bragging. Yeah. Because no matter what is going on in your life, you are always a living, breathing miracle. Yeah. And you just don't realize it. So that was such a good suggestion on, <laughs> on your part. And we and we would do, we do three brags a day. Yeah. Well, we would do a swamp and then three brags. So it was like, it was optional, right? Because I think what was amazing too is like, for the most part, we would kind of choose to swamp and then do three brags. Yeah. But there was kind of this like, maybe sometimes we'll just brag. We, which we're doing more and more actually now. Exactly. We're doing higher and higher levels. One of my favorite quotes of yours actually was when I called you and I was like, I, I, don't, I don't need to swamp today. I'm just going to brag. And you were like, I don't need a swamp either. I'm going to brag. And at the end, I was like, look at us just bragging that a swamp in sight. <laughs> you go, we're on the edge of glory. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it was so good. 
<laughs> and nothing against swamping. It's just like to own a season of having processed so yeah. much and get to ride in yeah. the glory of just yeah. the like positivity and yeah. slow and up leveling and then there'll be a whole nother swamp season coming right around the corner. Yeah, of course. Like, this of is course. humanity. It's so. course. Yeah. yeah. But the bragging is super useful because it actually, it kind of, um, it makes you so conscious mm. of how well you're doing despite the circumstances, mm. right? Mm -hmm. It's like you get to see, no, I, you know what? All right. Maybe I don't have the la 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 that I want yet, Yeah, but I am a heroine inside this life. I am phenomenal. I am like how brave, how courageous, how sh I show the fuck up yes. in my fullness yeah. in all the ways. Yeah. And then also you get to catch the miracles that happen mm -hmm. because when you're willing to show up in your fullness, then the universe kind of hands you unimaginable grace, unasked for grace. So we would just like be like, oh, you won't believe what just happened. Like yeah. what just went down. And really in the last year, there have been so many unbelievably magical, grace-filled moments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so, it, it, it always shifts things in my nervous system mm -hmm. to talk about not only like what is positive, but like it's truly like what am I proud about in myself? Yeah. And I didn't ever really used to feel proud of myself. Mm -hmm. And when I feel proud of myself, when I celebrate myself, it's like I want to keep going, yeah. you know, no matter what. Because it's like, running a marathon and having mm -hmm. no one cheering you on. Right. You know, like what would that feel like? Right. And oftentimes we do these heroic things each and every day inside yeah. of ourselves. We have no one to tell. Yeah. And so sometimes it's like, we don't get that like, Oh, to keep going. And one of the things I love too, that you teach is upriding. Uh huh. Yeah. So it's like, then after you'll brag, I will celebrate what it is that you just bragged, right? Yeah. Like, I'll, like I'll raise you up, I'll reflect it, yeah. I'll encourage it. Yeah. It gives this additional feeling of just like, wow, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. You know what's so interesting about that word, upriding? Mm. When I was touring schools when Maggie was four, I happened to go into a classroom and the teacher, it was like a first or second grade class that I was allowed to observe to ch decide if I wanted to choose a school or not. And the teacher said, uh, stopped a kid from insulting another kid. And she was saying something like, no, 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 no. We're not going to do it down ride. Mm. I want you to up ride. Ah. And so I watched the little boy switch ah. and praise the other child in the class. And I was like, oh, I am taking that. I'm taking that right on home because when you can hold a mirror for somebody of their greatness, mm rather than their darkness, because we, in our culture, we tend to kind of collaborate around, oh yeah, my boss, I hate my boss. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, your boss? Let me just tell you about my boss. And then soon we're like digging a downright hole yeah, yeah, yeah. rather than an upright hole, mm -hmm. which is a whole other experience physiologically. Mm -hmm. It gives your body a whole different reflection. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it just, and, and there's, it, it doesn't mean that you, you, you know, your brag doesn't have to be bigger than it is. Mm -hmm. Sometimes your brag is like truly a simple elemental thing. Like I got out of bed, I made myself a cup of tea. I got back in bed. And then if you say to me, rock on with everything going on in your life, baby, that you did that, you're the queen of the earth. And then I'm suddenly the queen of the earth because yeah. if you're upright. Yeah. And some of my favorite moments, honestly, are when we encourage each other to brag, even when yeah. we're like, no, I cannot, you oh. know, like, let's talk about the horse field again. And like, it was, <laughs> it was cold. It was dark. It was wet. I was in a very glamorous outfit <laughs> and I was so sad and yeah. I was outside of a very wonderful special event crying mm. in a horse field. Yeah. And I was like, I'm committed. You were so to committed. my misery. Like you I refused so to let you go. Were so, so damn I refused to let you go. Did. And you were like, you're going to give me three brags. And I was like, I will not. And you were like, yes. yes. And I accuse you. I was like, you are holdout bitch. And you're going to give me, you are not getting off this ah. phone. And you, and I, you owe me and you will give these to me because I could feel, I could feel that you were on the edge of glory. I could feel that <laughs> this was just resistance to what was about to happen for yeah. you. Cause I knew this set and, you know, and to have somebody, you know, that's what's so beautiful about our thing. Cause you, you will fiercely grab me by the scuff of, scuff of my neck and stand for me harshly. <laughs> I will do the same for you because we know 
you know, that it, that that if we were to do anything less than that, we wouldn't be living the truth of one another or our love or our commitment to each other. And you always feel better. I've never bragged and not felt better yeah. afterwards. And yeah. even that night, which was like a total like, like I'm just writing this one off, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. And I had like the night of my life that ended in this like sacred empowerment of my highest partnership in a hot tub at like 6 a.m. under the stars with my favorite. It was so, yeah. it was such an excellent night. And honestly, yeah. like if I hadn't been like forced to brag right. by you, I, I don't know that I could have gotten there because yeah. I would have just stayed in it. Yeah. And because bragging in addition to being a celebration of what is, it also allows you to digest. Mm. Like sometimes we get so overwhelmed by the goodness mm. in our lives mm. that we don't, uh, we, uh, and we, and we, and we start to feel cranky. Yeah. It's kind of like, uh, you know, if you, 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 you go to a, a Thanksgiving dinner mm. and you have like a big plate of something mm. Thanksgiving, like, which is a heavy night of food. And then the host comes back and they say, have seconds, mm. have thirds. And then you're like, Oh God, get those mashed potatoes away from me. Ah. You know, you get like full yeah. on goodness. Yeah. And you need to digest and bragging is a way of digesting. Mm. And once you do that, you make room for more mm. inside of you. Mm. So more could come and more was waiting for you with bated breath. More was like, <laughs> we're so ready. We are so ready for her. Oh yes. <laughs> so it's it's very, it's useful in a million different ways because it actually c- keeps your portal open. Mm. Uh, so that that you can continue to have more. It's not the reason to brag, but yeah. it, it does have that impact. Totally, and it and it resets your life for positivity. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's one of my favorite researchers, B.J. Fogg from I think the Human Behavior Institute at Stanford University. There's so much research coming out now that celebration, like a celebratory feeling, shining for yourself, is actually what's behind lasting habit change. Yeah, like if you want to change something in your life celebrating yourself mm-hmm. big and small is yeah. the absolute key. Yeah. And we, many of us got raised to believe that like bragging makes you full of yourself, makes you selfish, makes yeah. you narcissistic, makes yeah. you prideful, right? Which yeah. is bad. And there's actually something so life affirming mm-hmm. about it being like, this is what's epic yeah. about me, you yeah. know? And you remember, you remember your own greatness. Yeah. It's so true and so helpful. <laughs> and then you kind of throw the uh, uh, other, the other thing we've been doing recently um, do you want to switch gears and talk about spring cleaning? Yeah, we can use spring cleaning. So we or do you can see what else to... we want to talk about spring cleaning. We also did Cortisone's Journey at my birthday. If oh, we want to talk about yeah, that, we could do really that. Powerful. We could do that. Um, so there's spring cleaning, Cortisone's Journey. I think we can talk about sex magic. And for how sure. And that and use that for manifestation. And I think that's probably it. I think okay, those are the, that's good. Yeah. Well, let's, I want to stay on the bragging thing for a minute and the uh, and the spring cleaning thing for a minute because it's like, because you always complete the spring cleaning with a brag, a gratitude, and a desire. Mm. So it's kind of like how you pour the tool in. You you, you kind of mix tool cocktails yeah. and get it like exactly <laughs> the way you want it. Yeah. Uh, you know, just as be- because sometimes it's really, really good to swamp. Yeah. And you're, you're vomiting up the bilge and that's super helpful. But sometimes it's great to do a spring clean, which just allows you to Talk about the charge in a safe container, like as if the other person was a lightning rod or a father priest confessor. Mm. And you're just like dumping, 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 dumping for mm. five or 10 minutes, mm. which is useful as fuck. And then, but you can't just leave it raw and hanging. You have to end always with a brag, a gratitude, and a desire. Mm. And on that positive, like that note of like positive psychology and that celebratory space that's so transformative. When you do a brag mm. and then you do a gratitude, mm. it's like double loading all of that positivity. You, and then you lay a desire on top of that. Mm. Then you give, you're giving the desire like, you know, just like greasing the wheels. You're giving it legs. You're giving mm. it velocity. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's powerful. It's very powerful to do that and to be witnessed yeah. with each other inside of that. Because we're always evolving in our desires. There's always new, new things that we want. And one of the things you taught me about gratitude was that it really works to digest as well. 
Yeah. Right. When you get full on the goodness of life and, and we don't realize that that's happening, but oh, it really God. does. Like yeah. We have these upper limits on how much goodness mm-hmm. and pleasure we can take. And as yeah. soon as we hit our limit, if we're not bragging or doing gratitudes, it's like, we'll just self-sabotage yeah. or we'll go into a shitty spiral yeah. or downward spiral or whatever. And I remember calling you after my exceptional outlandishly wonderful birthday and I was crying and I was I whining. Remember. And it's and funny, we're making me sound like I just sob all the time. <laughs> I'm actually like a really like genuinely fun person to be around. But like we're, we're portraying me as that I'm like just fucking crying constantly. I cry a lot. So anyways, I like called you crying after my birthday. And I was like, this is a, it's a good session. And you were like, you're not sad. You're just being a really ungrateful whiny little bitch right now. <laughs> Because you're so full on goodness. Yeah. Because that birthday just rained down blessings upon no, you. No, the you birthday like, was amazing. The birthday was amazing. You were like, you have to write a hundred gratitude. Yeah. And I was like, fuck you. And yeah. you were like, you were like, no, like, yeah. like you have to do it. And I did it. Yeah. Digested yeah. the whole thing. It's so true. I was like, my birthday is amazing. Your birthday is amazing. You're and amazing. That's the thing about the bragging and the gratitude, right? If you're not doing that, yeah. just tie it back to the divine masculine. Tie it back to being in partnership with yeah. a man or, or dating a man. You're going to get whiny and bitchy and ungrateful for him. Yeah, exactly. You're going to get stuck in yeah. your stuff. And, you know, inspired by you, I've been starting my journaling every day, especially since this reconnect with Peter. Yeah. I've been starting my day with just like a flood of gratitudes. Yeah. Because it's so easy to look at what I don't have or what, you know, what one doesn't have. But in my case... I look at, you know, I can have a tendency to be like, okay, wait a minute. So yeah, I'm in love with him. I pussy, my heart are open. I, it's like the most amazing. And he's still dating someone else. And I, so I don't have exactly, what I, you know, I can go. And then I'm like, Mm-mm. you're going to go to gratitude. And then I just like start laying them down in my journal. Yeah. First thing, just get them. get, And then I'm always blown away. I'm like, I could have gone this entire lifetime yeah. without ever having experienced this level of love. Yeah. And I am not doing that. Mm. I have changed my destiny. Mm. I freed myself. And, and by doing so, I'm not laying that on the next generation, mm. on my daughter. And I can see the liberation in her already. Yeah. So I, I, I'm just... And, and so I'm riding hard on the gratitudes at, at this particular moment. Oh, hey there. I am stirring up a cup of my favorite elixir. So this is Sex Magic. And this is an incredible product from the sexy supplement company, Mood. It's my company. We formulated this with an all-female team of scientists to be able to activate your Eros. So it can help you feel tingly. It can bring more energy into your life, more creativity. And if you take it under the right circumstances, you can have better sex. So I love taking this before sex magic with my partner. I love taking it honestly when we get home from date night and I'm like, whoa, wait, too much chicken. How am I ever going to get in the mood? I also like taking it after a long day of work when I'm also like, I don't even want to go to the dinner and eat the chicken. So got to drink this be- before we even eat the chicken and then maybe afterwards to get in the mood. You know what I'm saying? And what it does is it just opens up my body. It opens up my heart. I feel tingly. I feel alive. Um, sometimes it helps me have a better orgasm and it is sugar-free. It's sweetened with monk fruit. Uh, that beautiful purple color comes from beetroot and blueberries. And it is just this incredible mix of ingredients like shilajit and huperzine A and makuna puriens. So special. Um, if you were feeling called to check it out, you can head over to shopmood.com. That's shopmood, M-O-O-D.com. And there's a special discount code for being part of this tantric life it is this tantric life 15 so you're just going to enter that at checkout and you're going to get 15 percent off of your first order what are are you what what tools are you writing on right now well i've been doing gratitude journaling every day morning and night sometimes i get behind but like I, i pretty much have done it uh consistently for going on four years now and you know like the research shows it makes a big difference. I, like everyone now says like, wow, Layla, like you're so grateful. <laughs> like you just seem so grateful for, for the world. And I'm like, that's just cause I puked up all my whiny bitchiness on the highway <laughs> with Regina. Um, but no, it, it really did change me. You know, yeah. it really, like I do feel this like deep, potent commitment to mm-hmm. feeling grateful. Yeah. And, and don't you find that it puts you in that, like, I don't know. I feel it makes me feel holy. Yeah. Like I'm in that flow. Like I'm like, I am so, 
so privileged to be alive. Yeah. Because the el- the deepest elemental truth is we're lucky for this breath. Yeah. We have no control over this. This is an outstanding gift from the God goddess universe. Yeah. And when you're conscious of it, then like you can actually feel like, wow. Yeah. Breath. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I have another breath. Yeah. You know, it's like so much. And like the universe owes us nothing. Nothing. And we got this. Yeah, we got this. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> I'm loving this. I think for the first night, what do you think about this one for the first, you know, for your honeymoon night when you get to <laughs> Australia? <laughs> Or do you have that all picked out already? <laughs> it's something important to discuss. <laughs> because, you know, when you get the lingerie, right? Uh, everything goes right. <laughs> I find. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I haven't. I, so I don't know how much I've talked to you about this directly, but also in, like, what tools am I using right now? It's interesting that I did so much of the work, like, right, with the swamping, um, with owning my journey, right? Which yeah. you call the courtesan's journey, which we can talk about in a yeah. minute. Um, and, and, and meeting my fears. Like I would say, like, I feel like wow. such an accomplished shadow walker, you know, you need someone to yeah. puke in a bucket and yeah. laugh. I'll do it. You need yeah. someone to go to like the center of a yeah. fear or trauma. Mm-hmm. Like I'm there, you know? Mm-hmm. And after a huge lifetime wave of that, mm-hmm. not only me individually, but I feel there's a collective vibration happening yeah. right now. Mm-hmm. For some of us, I realize this is an incredibly like privileged thing to say, but it doesn't, I, I hope for it not to be privileged eventually, which is like, now it feels like there's this transmission coming universally of like, can you open your aperture for goodness? Can you mm-hmm. open your nervous system mm-hmm. to all mm-hmm. the pleasure that this universe has uh. to offer? Because we do live on an extraordinary planet yeah. with these incredible yeah. bodies there's so much joy and yeah. joy, luckily, and pleasure and gratitude, yeah. not a zero sum game. Yeah. Like I can feel as much joy and gratitude and pleasure as possible and everyone around me can have theirs too. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, it's not resource, it's connection. And there's a, there's, there's something about that where I feel there's a kind of something in the air right now that is asking us to remember what is so magnificent, what is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I do think in many ways that that is a huge portal to humanity being in deepest alignment that actually our best selves come from that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, if you think about it, like Audre Lorde said, you cannot dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. Yeah. And she didn't go on to say what the non-master's tools were. But she did say that pleasure could she the did. revolution. She did. And she was all yeah. about the erotic. You know, yeah. I think one of the seminal essays I've ever read in my life, and I probably read it thousands of times, I almost know it by heart, is the use of the erotic as power, yeah. which, uh, in which she talks about the seed of eroticism. Mm. And eroticism is, you know, that sense of uh, celebration, of aliveness that permeates your body, that uh, where you are turned on mm. to the experience of your own aliveness, no matter if you are painting a fence or creating, you know, another masterpiece on uh, of poetry or on a, a canvas or however you create your masterpieces. But that essence is something that is, I, I agree with you. It's like coming forward, like, can we squeeze the joy? and celebration from this right now. Yeah. And it's so, there's a, a velocity to that mm. that is worthy of paying attention to. And, yeah. Um, uh, and, and just standing in deep appreciation of and all the ways it shows up. Totally. I remember when I was, probably would have been like 20 or something like that, and deep activist at Stanford, political activist, and uh, George W. Bush was coming to give a speech. This is in the uh, heyday of the start of the Iraq war. And we had the Hoover Institutes. So it was like Donald Rumsfeld. And the, the, so many of um, Condoleezza Rice all came from the Hoover Institute. And so like I laid down in front of Bush's motorcade and like. <laughs> <laughs> well bragged. It was, yes, you did. <laughs> and I got dragged. I, I had been making out with a woman. So like I like I. 
whatever, like I got dragged by like the cops and the National Guard. And so there was actually a photo of me in Getty Images. I'll have to, I'll ha hopefully I can find it one day. But there's all these National Guardsmen standing around me and I'm handcuffed on the ground, right? They like shoved me to my knees, hands are handcuffed behind me. And I remember thinking, I was like, what is the most radical thing I could do in this situation? And I was like, they can never take my joy. Yeah. So I started howling with laughter. So there's this photo of me like <laughs> handcuffed, surrounded by the National Guard with all these weapons. And I'm like laughing my head. My head is thrown back. There's like sunshine on me. And I just had this like ecstatic laughter. And it was like, I won't buy into the consciousness that got us here. You yeah. know, mm -hmm. not even if you handcuff me and kick yeah. me. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Little, little Victor Frankl that you are. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far, but I definitely, I, I, I had, I had the, the rebellious spirit fueled by joy. Yeah. 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 I think yeah. that's, that's, that, that could be like the, you know, uh, sort of the, your, your motto, Layla Martin. <laughs> what is she? Rebellious spirit fueled by joy. <laughs> Uh, so did you, was there anything else you wanted to say about the spring cleaning, which we've been using more recently? We've been using more recently. Yeah. It's been really good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, it, I think I said it, you know, and, and, and if anybody wants to catch up with it in more detail, I literally have spring cleaning in all four of my books because I believe in it so wholeheartedly. And I feel like it's a, it's a construct and an exercise that everybody would benefit from because yeah. it's a way of getting rid of your charge. So we don't have to, they can buy a book. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow and i think like like really i just want to reiterate that like us going on this journey of i want to have true love sacred union i want to have the relationship sexually intimately emotionally that i know is my soul's truth before i die yeah. and how intense that journey has been psychologically and emotionally to know our own worth in partnership um all of these tools felt necessary. Like we couldn't have done it yeah. without that. No, we could not. And it was the swamping and the bragging mm -hmm. and the gratituding and the desiring. Yeah. And now the spring cleaning. Yeah. Um, and you also did, there's one more that I want to touch on, which is the courtesan's journey. Right. Which to me is really an ownership of the Oof. wisdom of every moment of your life. Mm -hmm. is what it feels like to me. Yeah, especially the moments that are, uh, let's say, so violent or devastating or dark that you cannot comprehend mm -hmm. how they might be of service, but mm -hmm. until you do, you will always be life's victim mm -hmm. instead of the courtesan. Mm -hmm. And I use the courtesan, like to me, courtesans were not hookers or whores or prostitutes. They were women that were conscious of their sacred erotic aliveness. Mm. And they were like quantum physicians. Mm. They knew how to use this brilliance, radiance that they had mm. as a tool of transformation, not just for themselves, but for the culture at large. Mm. So uh, they were the most powerful women in their time at a time when women had absolutely no power. Mm. And so I always go back to them. So the courtesan's journey came from that because um, in studying the courtesans, which are so worthy of studying one of the great books, the book of the courtesans by Susan Griffin is amazing. And Betsy Prelu uh, wrote an incredible book about courtesans as well. Um, so these women, uh, to me, were so inspiring because most of them, they, well, they all had everything. The one thing they all had in common was they came from nothing. Mm. And then they had so much, uh, so many forces against them. Mm. They could, women in those ages, they, they could never make enough money to even pay for their food and shelter. There was oh. always, they were impoverished beyond anything we could imagine now. Mm. And they were women that rose above their circumstance by doing that very thing that you described when you threw your head back and laughed when you were there handcuffed. Mm. Was that you were choosing joy. Mm. You were choosing the gift of life no matter the surrounding circumstance. Mm -hmm. And so they were able to transmute whatever was happening and rise to become the icons, the trendsetters, the stars mm -hmm. of, of their, their time. But uh, the courtesan's journey is an exercise that you do, like 
you know, all of us have certain sticky wicket. Like, hmm. Well, let's talk about my birthday because I think we okay. talk about the tr- contest of my birthday. All right, let's talk about it because I actually flew out to that birthday <laughs> to do this tortoise on journey with you because I was like, girlfriend needs this. Girlfriend needs this shit right now. So it, at that birthday, I had very recently uncoupled from Andrew, very right. recently ended things with the, with the other man in my life. And I also had long COVID. I hadn't slept for months. It was Bash shit crazy. It was that that was the coughing too, wasn't it? Yeah, oh. I had a cough until I was coughing blood. It was yeah, yeah. It was it There's was no holding it was back a low point. You. I yeah. still threw a great party though, like beyond belief. It was like, one of the best <laughs> ever. <laughs> Just like ah, uh, never gonna let let down the opportunity to throw a great party, even no. if I'm like cr- crawling. No, you, know, you will my not. Hands and knees that bloodied. is what makes you you. And. <laughs> And I was like, yo, I got to change my relationship with masculine. Yeah. I was like, I got to do something like, like, we got to like, we got to have an intervention. Yeah. And generally I like for my birthday to be a service to the people I love, right? Like my birthday is not mm-hmm. about me. It's about us all yeah. having the best time ever. I was like, look in this weekend long, in this four day birthday. Cause like we just, our friend group can't handle. <laughs> not like, just one day. A single birthday can't day. Be a party um, until it's four days. I was like, we can take two hours and I want to be witnessed in community. Yeah. As I own the story of my sexual abuse with my father. And that was the request that can we do the courtesan's journey on that aspect, um, my relationship with masculine. And you had me strip naked and own it. Yeah. Like own it from the inside out. Own it from that. Here's, here's the difference. Okay. What your father did was wrong. It was illegal. He should be fucking castrated. And that journey is going to lead to victimhood. Mm. The only thing that leads to your liberation is when you say, I chose this man. Mm. I chose this man to give me this experience so I could connect with resources within myself that I never would have known that I never would have stepped into so early that it's so that my sex was engaged and alive from the time I was the littlest child. Like I chose this Mm -hmm. to be broken in precisely this way. So the woman standing before you right now could be Mm -hmm. because you never could be this were it not for him. Mm -hmm. He is, he was, the entry point into your magic. And and when you own that, that's a different version of you walking around the world because you're not, you're not carrying that darkness as um, like a a burden. You're carrying it as a liberation. And then you become the liberation of that for so many women Mm. that have similar or parallel storylines. And so it was, you know, that, that, that shit is not easy to do. It no. is not easy. I think, too, like the power of the courtesan's journey and the way that you guide that process, right? Like, so when I first started doing healing for sexual abuse and there were like lots of healers who would be like, oh, well, you chose this, like your soul chose this, you know. Number one, I wasn't ready to feel right. that, see that, understand that. Like yeah. I needed to process on a human level how yeah. fucked up it was. Yeah, because on need to do on, the swamping of it. Yeah, on some level, as you're saying, like there has to be a reckoning yeah. with the fact that it was fucked up. It mm-hmm. was wrong. There was a legitimate victim experience Completely. in me as a child, right? Yeah. So owning that first, but also a lot of people who had space, it was like they wanted to say that so that they could somehow feel better about the world. Yeah. Like what I had been through was so unthinkable to them. Yeah. That when they were mm. like, well, we all chose our lives, mm. our souls or whatever, it not only rang hollow, but it was like, don't, uh, don't use my experience to try and feel better about yeah. this world, this reality, because like we all know it's got some serious shadow, evil, pain, yeah. wounding trauma, right? Yeah. And, and to face that um, it is very important. So it's not something you can throw around, but in the courtesan's journey, it's an invitation in my experience for, for my soul and my psyche to to see that and i and i will say this and it, it's a delicate thing to say right because it, at at the wrong time in a healing journey it can actually potentially be counterproductive yeah and for me 
I ha- still carry this like lingering heavy trauma in my bones, even yeah. into my 30s, where I was like, wow, like I still feel mm-hmm. the heaviness of that abuse. I still feel it. It's mm-hmm. like it's with me every single day. Yeah. And and I feel it somatically in my body. And I did a, a process with my my tantra teacher at the time, Sarita, Manan Sarita, and she did a past life regression. And I actually felt myself like we don't have to get into whether this is true or not in 3D reality, but it was like like as like tantric, you know, like mastery development in past life. And then this choice to go the lowest of the low, to descend into yeah. the unworthiness and the trauma and the de- yeah. depths of pain yeah. so that I could understand humanity on a deeper level, yeah. that I could heal on a deeper yeah. level, that I could teach at a deeper level, uh-huh. that I could have compassion at a deeper level. And a series of these really low vibration, painful, traumatizing lifetimes uh, led into, yes, the the choice of this father and my soul choosing one of the deepest wounds that a human can have in this lifetime right. because the excavation out of that pain, and don't get me wrong, it has taken so much That's from me, right. so much from me. Like right. it's not to like whitewash it. It's not to be like, no. oh, thank you for that like deep no. ass trauma. No, like I... I could not have the sex and relationship and love right. and connection to men that I wanted almost my entire life. Mm-hmm. Like I lived lonely, exhausted, sad mm-hmm. with chronic fatigue. Like it has been hell getting mm-hmm. myself out of that. Mm-hmm. So I don't mean for anyone listening to understand mm-hmm. sexual trauma through a lens of like some no. sort of gold medal. Um, and, and having said that and having said to anyone who has not been through that, that like, if you haven't been through it, you have no idea what it feels like and what it takes mm-hmm. to even just get through the day sometimes, right. let alone love, let alone feel pleasure again. And it's a tremendous privilege to have the time, space, and energy to be able to integrate a wound like that, unfortunately, in our planet right now. Right. And I had the privilege to, to integrate that wound, to do the work, to right. move through it. And in that, it has absolutely become one of the greatest gifts of empathy, compassion, being right. able to sit in right. any depth of anyone's shadow with right. them and not flinch because I've right. been there with my own. That's right. And in that, exactly as you're saying, all victim is gone. And then yeah. I don't have to live as a walking sorrow about what was taken from me, but in like grand gratitude for what every moment of this universe offers. And what I would say to anyone listening who like, it's kind of like inconceivable that you could get there. I had a Tantra teacher once who said every moment is blessing or curse. Yeah. Every moment can be medicine or poison yeah. and you get to choose. Yeah. And to me, the courtesan's journey is this opportunity yeah. for any woman or any person to choose the medicine. Right. Or to choose the blessing. Right. But you have to do it at a soul level. You have right. to do it in a, in a deep somatic yeah. way or else it's fake. And, and the invitation of that process is for it to be at a soul level reclaimed. Right. And the space has to be a, held by a woman who has trod those steps herself. Mm. It can't be. It's not a casual thing. Mm. You know, it's... Uh, it's something that is hard one, as you say, you know, where, where, uh, you, you know, first there is that excavation of that wounding beyond wounding. Mm. And then it is almost as if that reclamation gives you the ability to hold space for others to step into theirs mm. because you have not been killed mm-hmm. by your own death. Mm. of you know so it is uh which i in my opinion that is the gift of the feminine Mm -hmm. that's the gift of eight thousand nerve endings that's the gift of having a womb womb of having a pussy of being able to be the giver of life because Mm -hmm. even if you do not push out a baby that is that's not the the limitation of how we give life we give life by um claiming our own by and and by standing in that essential raw gratitude like all these things interweave and hook deeply into each other which is you know which immediately when you're choosing gratitude you're un 
hooking from the victimization of a patriarchal world culture. And you're saying, I am choosing life. Mm. I am choosing myself. And I am choosing to say yes to the adventure of being me in all its forms. Mm. And that is, you know, that it's, it's like, it's such, first of all, it's a privilege to live, mm. but it's a privilege to liberate others. Mm. And, and it's like, I, I think it's like the incumbency. It's that thing that you're describing about the culture is evolving mm. now where we're all starting to be like, whoa, there is liberation in my ability to celebrate this particular moment right now, not mm. just for myself, but for everyone that I encounter. Mm. And then your medicine just gets more and more and more powerful mm. the, as with each passing day. Mm. Mm. Ooh, yes, yes, courtesan's journey. It was, you did so good. It takes so much courage to do that. So much. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So transformative. So let's take it home. Let's talk about sex magic now. Sex magic. The whole point of the whole point of all of this is to really connect and empower a woman to live inside of her desires and her deepest longings. And you have really potent mag uh, magic around that and medicine around that <laughs> that we have practiced together on many many occasions. I look forward to more. Yeah. So tell oh. tell us about sex magic and your relationship with that practice. So sex magic is you know part and parcel of knowing what you want, having a desire. Yeah. Right. And getting very, very clear on that desire. I do it in a five senses reality, which is like, when you have that desire, what does it look like? What, what do you feel? What do you hear? What do you taste? What do you touch? That activates your whole nervous system. It brings your desire into 3d reality. It also helps your nervous system know, like it's safe to have that reality. Mm -hmm. It's safe to have that desire. Because most of the time when we don't get what we want, it's because we don't feel safe to have yeah. it. Then you go into either self-pleasure practice if you're doing solo sex magic or you can do it with a partner and you, let's talk solo, you're turning yourself on and you're starting to use the power of your eros, the power of your turn on yeah. to activate both your entire nervous system. So you spiral the pleasure through each band of the seven chakras as you're turning yourself on. And so it's like your whole body, your whole nervous system becomes activated with erotic power. This also switches your whole body on so that when you do the manifestation, it's like your whole nervous system is listening, including your subconscious. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the time what is stored, like our fears, our resistances, our traumas are actually stored in deeper parts of our nervous system. And when we activate our body, the deeper parts of our nervous system come online. So instead of just being like an affirmation, which comes from the most superficial part of your mind, you're actually wiring the deepest parts of your nervous system to desire what you're saying you want to find opportunities for it in the environment, to have your subconscious on board with what you want. It's so powerful. As you're turning yourself on, turning yourself on, you're using this erotic power. When you get to the crown of your head, you can go into a peak state of pleasure or into an orgasm and you put yourself into the visualization of those five senses of what it is that you most desire. Mm -hmm. This not only has the heightened energy source of your erotic energy basically fueling your desire, yeah but it imprints a high state of pleasure with what you want. Because oftentimes when we want something and we don't get it over and over again, it's that our nervous systems actually believe that it's scary, right? I want love, but I'm actually terrified, right? I want more money, but I'm scared of playing a bigger game in the world. I want to have more impact in my career, but it's not safe to be seen, right? We actually are afraid of what mm -hmm. it is that we say we want. So when we imprint this high state of pleasure, with what we most desire, we're actually rewiring our nervous system to say, oh, that's not a scary thing. That's a highly pleasurable thing. So when you put it all together, it's like this super highway to manifestation, which is so fun. And you're rewiring your body instead of pushing your sexual pleasure out, you're bringing your sexual pleasure up and in and you're retraining, as we've talked about uh, in this podcast, you're retraining your nervous system yeah. to be able to hold more pleasure, yeah. more arrows, mm -hmm. more turn on. Mm -hmm. And you get to do it with your friends, which is so fun. It's so true. And, and it's so much more powerful. And I have found like there's so much more turn on. Mm. Like I myself, if I'm lying there, I'm doing sex, sex magic myself, which I love to do. But when you have other bodies in the room, mm. other women, other men, mm. it's like yeah. so much turn on. You don't have to like 
work as hard to crank yourself up. You just ride yeah. the truth. And it's so beautiful and powerful and amazing. It's the original church, man, getting turned on. Yeah. Using the power of your arrows to be a co-creator with this universe. Yeah. It's so powerful. Yeah, it's so powerful and beautiful. I love it. I love it. And we've done it in so many different forms with so many different friends, with so many different you know, circumstances and it's, it is just like, it's delicious. Yeah. Yeah. Anywhere we can. Mm -hmm. And that keeps us in alignment with like the clearing and the integrating and the activating and then the seeding and activation. Of how, the how, did, how did you start it? Like when, what was the seed of this genius, this practice? Well, I learned sex magic when I lived in Thailand. Um, ah. Yeah, I actually did a, a tantra workshop with a, a facilitator who like, like sexually harassed me and many, many other women to the point of it being like violent and seriously unhealthy. So I won't say who he is, but mm -hmm. um, we did group sex magic. There were like 40 of us. Oh, my God. Yeah. And it was it was so amazing. It was probably like 15 years ago. And it was so deeply transformative and powerful. And, um, it's interesting, uh, Margot Nand, who's like one of the kind of, she, oh, yeah. you know, potent Western transmitters of Tantra. Um, she really popularized sex magic in many ways. Mm -hmm. I never worked with her directly, but, um, she did a lot to spread the practice. And as I've looked for the roots of it, so, so Margot Nand, one of the great Western teachers and transmitters of, of Tantra and Osho lineage to the West, uh, she really popularized sex magic. Um, I've been doing a lot of work to find out really like the true origins of it. There's mm -hmm. definitely origins in the European traditions and the Celtic traditions of sex magic practices. Yeah. And I have actually found some really cool sex magic practices in classical Tantra. A lot of kind of male scholars and teachers say like, oh, it, it doesn't belong to the Tantric tradition. And I've been finding in some of the traditional texts um, citations of using sexual energy for magic and manifestation. So it feels wow. like it belongs to uh, these, these amazing ancient traditions of humanity. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it was one of the things that got, got so heavily stamped out yeah. because it reminds you of your sovereignty, your divinity, your power, all of these things that once you remember, it's like you become a free being. Wow. It's so great. And the way you have brought it to so many of us, like of our friend group, of the the people whose lives you impact in your work, it's like just spreading little seeds of magic that anyone can use anytime and kind of liberate themselves as they step more powerfully into what they long for. Yeah. So I love it. I love it. <laughs> so what would you say then for, for anyone listening who's like, all right, like I want to, I want to incorporate these tools into sisterhood. I know to professionally lead them and teach them, you have yeah. an incredible certification where you I can do. become a teacher and leader. Yep. And so, you know, I'd love for you to talk about that. And then also to talk about, look, like I want to grab my best friend and do, do one or two of these practices. Yeah. What would you recommend? Okay. Anybody that wants to just grab a friend and practice, every single one of the tools that we talked about is showing up in one of my books. Great. Either Mom and Gina School of Womanly Arts or pussy, a reclamation. So those are the two, uh, the, it's probably in the owners and operators and the marriage manual, but very specific instructions about how to do this because I wrote those books knowing that women were going to want to grab them and practice with a friend. Yeah. And I have gotten so many emails or DMs or whatever of people saying, I swamp every day now, or I do sprinkling. You know, yeah. it's actually a thing you can learn and thing you can do. And I recommend grabbing at least a friend mm to do it, you know, or, or creating like a little book club and practicing every week. Cause it's worthy. It's worth it. And people can always DM me on Instagram. Cause I do, I don't know why yeah. I love reading my messages and I do that. <laughs> <laughs> I do that. So I will hit you and give you a little instruction and like help you and shape it, you know, but, but the instructions are on the books. Yeah. So, or take virtual pleasure yeah. bootcamp, which is of course I teach every year. Yeah. It's the foundational. It's the, it's, it's just the whole Thing, all of this stuff shows up in there. And yes. then you'll get live training in an eight-week program that is delicious. Yes. There are women that are listening to this who know that they have a destiny mm. to lead, to teach, to facilitate. Mm. And once a year, I teach my teacher training pleasure coaching certification mm. program 
because I want women to be able to use all of this technology that we use, but I don't teach sex magic. That's yours. Mm. Um, and I want them to be able to use this technology to uh, assist as we, as women are always assisting in the liberation of our friends, our loved ones, and the world at large by the way we show up, mm. not show up shrinking, but show up stepping fully into who we are. Mm. And these practices are just a vehicle for that. So there's a lot of ways no. to get high. And we're gonna <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and I think good. the simplest thing to think about with your friends is do something where you feel safe to embody your shadow, the pain, the wound, and you can show up with love with each other. That's swamping, right? Yeah. And then brag. And then brag. Swamp and brag. Swamp, swamp and brag. And brag. Swamp, swamp and brag. And, brag. and you mm -hmm. can add so much more on top of that. Yeah. But I think if you make it more complicated, it might be hard to get started. Yeah. I think and it's the best. Hey, we like mostly just swamp and brag, we you do. know? We you do. can get and look at real us far our, yeah. on swamp and brag. You can. <laughs> you can. I do want to say that all these tools, it, we currently we're using them because we are on this mighty path to uh, Lori. partnership, yeah. <laughs> Lori, <laughs> you know, with both of us have are you know, stepping towards these, uh, you know, this incredible experience, each of us in more intimacy and more, um, like just openness and open heartedness and love and connection and sexual aliveness with these different men that we are practicing with. And, uh, these tools m allow us to have the courage to keep going even when we're scared and even when we're stepping into places that we have not been before. Yeah. So it's, um, I want that for all women. I want women to be able to step beyond where their courage stops and w where their fear begins and still step forward. And these tools are just like a great yeah. uh, asset to have. Well, it's like the tools can improve your life and you can uh, kind of, ride what you inherited without the tools but if you want to take a leap a quantum leap uh, a leap in what you've ever known sexually spiritually emotionally yeah. in relationship in yeah. devotion to the divine masculine you've got to digest your karma right that's yeah. a like a deep tantric teaching you've got yeah. to process yeah. the programming in your nervous system mm -hmm. and the brilliance of your tools is they have all the power of ancient mystical technology but they're so modern. They're so accessible. User friendly. So easy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's so true. Great. Okay, so like, let's see. As a, like, if I was to hold a desire for you right now, it would be like to, wow. Like right now, I'm seeing you with the person you're dating, and I'm seeing you. Uh, this might make you vomit in your mouth, but I'm seeing you like choosing to get married in a totally brand new way of creating partnership and have a child. Mm. And <laughs> your like, face. <laughs> wow. 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 I feel like that's, I don't know. That's what's coming up for me in my what's next for you. The, 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 con the, the subtext here is that Regina is always kind of subtly talking me out of having a child and I don't like need to have a child or want one that bad. But, but when I suggest the notion, it's Regina who's like, unless it's a must, like don't, you know? <laughs> and, and thank God we need women telling us that. And, uh, yeah. So the fact that you are now desiring a child for me is, I know outrageous. it's kind of outrageous. How dare, you're busy. How dare me? <laughs> yeah. So. Anyway, we will see, we will see because one thing we will know is we will keep spring cleaning until whatever we want comes through. And, you know, swamping and bragging and la, 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 sex magicking, all of it. <laughs> One of the early things you said to me that I love so much when I asked you to swamp, this is years ago, like an early swamp that we did on Zoom. Uh -huh. You were like, I really admire how quickly you can go from like teaching and normalcy to puking over the side of the bed. And I was like, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> The system processes karma, you know? Yeah, absolutely. May it always be so. All right. My desire for you, the highest sacred union sexually, emotionally, spiritually, yes. and being so fucking mm. chosen mm -hmm. unquestionably yeah. in the container mm -hmm. of safety and dedication and devotion that is in deepest alignment with your heart, your pussy, and your inner child's desires. So may that be with Peter Sweeney or even better.
That's how she'll be, baby. Let's <laughs> make it <laughs> so good. Thank yes. you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your sisterhood. Thank you for your love. I love you. Thank you. I love you. They're so <laughs> beautiful. I can't wait to share them. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> So the practice I want to share with you is how to swamp. So this is going to be Swamp 101. You can find detailed instructions in Mama Gina's books. And I highly recommend that you study with Mama Gina more in depth. Go get on her email list, follow her, join her program. She's got an amazing professional certification. She's got pleasure boot camp. So, so, so good. And I'll give you the 101. So if you're watching this and you're like, how can I get started with swamping? So there are uh, four stages. So the first is to get in touch with what is bothering the shit out of you, what is uncomfortable, what is heavy, what is hard. And you can either voice this, like literally share it out loud or journal about it if you want to get in touch with it. But then you want to put on a piece of music. This is step two. And you want to embody the living shit out of it. So what that means is instead of thinking about it or judging it or trying to push it away, you're going to feel it. Take some deep breaths into your body and let yourself express. So if you're mad, beat the shit out of some pillows. If you're sad, cry into some tissues. Um, If you are afraid, like tremble on the floor, right? The idea is to get out of thinking about it or out of trying to push it away and into the embodied experience of it. When you start to touch it, when you really feel it, it shifts how you relate to it. When I'm in my full sadness, it actually feels good. When I'm in my full rage, it feels amazing. When I let myself feel fear, it's incredible. It's aliveness itself, right? Like I say so often, I hope you feel fear in this lifetime. I hope you feel sad in this lifetime. I hope you feel enraged in this lifetime. Could you say that you were really living if you didn't feel heartbreak and fear and anger at times, right? I want you to feel these things. And so when you let yourself embody them and move with them, you give yourself over to the experience. You're no longer trying to fight with life or your embodied experience. You're allowing it to happen. In step three, you start to turn yourself on. So you literally can turn on the sadness, turn on the anger. And literally what I do is I'll start to stroke my body as I'm feeling enraged. I'll start to stroke my body as I'm crying. And what this does is it's like it activates your full aliveness so you don't get trapped in this victim mentality or this heaviness. It's like, oh, fuck yeah, I'm feeling sad. Fuck yeah, I'm pissed off right now, right? There's this ownership that sets in that's so potent finally step four you just go wild with your arrows you fuck a pillow you stroke yourself you get hot you get heavy you're like when me and regina do this we're like up against walls like fucking touching ourselves and howling and just doing it so hot and hard and beautiful it's so 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 good and the reason that you finish with your turn on it elevates the practice. It brings it into just a level of hotness and bliss and healing that's so super potent. So this is the intro. This is like Swamp 101. And in order to take it further and dive into the mystery and genius of the woman who innovated this practice, I highly recommend that you take all of Regina's classes, read all of her books, and just, oh, just marinate in the beauty of her Instagram. Thank you so much for being here, for listening to this tantric life. Thank you for making it to the end of a podcast. That is an accomplishment. And if you want to learn more, if you want practical tools and guidance in tantra and sacred sexuality, then head on over to laylamartin.com. Sign up with your email address. You're probably like, email? What is this, 1996? Let me tell you, my emails are special. They're also so not safe for work that we send them on Sundays because they are chock full of some of the most uh, licensed licentious education that you are ever going to find. So I share in-depth tantric trainings, practical tools that you can incorporate into your life every single day. I also talk about really embarrassing and shocking moments from my own life as I guinea pig this entire tradition for myself in my own life. And if you want to stay connected, that is the way to stay connected. We also have incredible resources there. So if you want to learn sex magic, breath work, uh, couple sex practices, tantric sexuality on the website, you can 
can get those trainings for free if you head over and check it out, laylamartin.com. Finally, go ahead and follow me on Instagram. Don't miss a single reel. That's at the Layla Martin. You can also follow me on YouTube to make sure you don't miss any of these podcasts. That is Layla Martin. And thank you once again so much, so much, so much for being here. I can't wait to share more with you.